Uh, All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to call this meeting to order and just begin with uh, a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that we're gathering today, uh, those of us who are here in person on the unceded territories of the Kamox First Nation, the traditional keepers of this land. And uh, we begin the meeting with um, a call to order and we have a recommendation, uh, sorry, a, a call to order and then approval of the agenda. So if I can get a motion for, okay. Wells and Arbor, uh, anyone opposed? Perfect, okay. And uh, there's no in-camera meeting, so we'll move next to adoption of minutes. Okay, this time it's Arbor and Wells, just to keep it fresh. Um, anyone opposed? Okay, fantastic. Um, the next piece is public input for the uh, 2023 to 27 financial plan. I'll just hand that over to our CAO. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And uh, during the budget process at this point in the agenda, we will acknowledge any receipt of information that uh, comes from the public with respect to your financial plan. Being that this is the first uh, introduction of it, uh, there's nothing to report at this time. But I just wanted to let you know that on February 7th, the uh, Comox Valley Regional District will be hosting a um, online uh, workshop with respect to the budget process. And uh, it is intended for all members of the public or any interest groups that work in association with the Solid Waste Management Board, as well as all of our other services. It's just talking about the basics of the budget, the importance of receiving public input and feedback, and we hope that may generate a little bit more in the future. So that's February the 7th, and we will send out to you a reminder of that so that you can share it with any of your interests if there's people in your community that, that would like to, uh, to learn more about the budget process. Great, thanks very much. And uh, at this point, we'll move into reports. And the first one is the Comex Strathcona Waste Management Advisory Committee. And those are minutes for receipt. Arbor and Wells, anyone opposed? Okay, and that passes. And next is the uh, priorities and work plan. And that's for receipt. And uh, I'm imagining, can I get a motion for receipt? Again? Okay, the usual two. And I'll pass it over to our CAM. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And I'll refer this matter to Vivian Shaw that will present the report and be prepared to answer any questions of the board members. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Russell, and through the uh, chair to the CSWM board, good morning. Uh, the purpose of this report is to present the 2023 work plan uh, in a more digestible uh, format. Uh, the work plan is really developed uh, through, or it's guided by the, uh, the financial plan and uh, all, the la all the tasks and items that are itemized in this report is also included in the financial plan. Uh, so the Again, the strategic direction and the key priorities that are outlined within this report um, is really guided by the solid waste management plan objective, the three main objectives uh, that were approved back in 2012. Um, the three of them being the, the, the first one being the minimization of waste generation itself, uh, the second being the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and the third uh, is the management of the residual waste uh, in an environmentally responsible and compliant manner. So in under the first category, there are a number of act key actions that we are undertaking as staff uh, to encourage the minimization of waste. Uh, the first one being the, the, the continued education in our communities to promote um, and create awareness and bringing that um, education to the broader community and through our school education system uh, to really reduce the minimization of uh, the waste that's actually disposed at our regional landfill and investigating various uh, disposal options um, moving forward. Uh, the second one being the uh, Solid Waste Management Plan renewal process, which uh, what was underway starting in June last year. We got approval from the previous board to initiate this process. Uh, this is um, a massive undertaking and uh, you'll hear to, um, from Sarah Willie, who's gonna be managing this process um, in a subsequent report. 
I, I do want to just, uh, sorry, I know this is, I'm digressing, but I wanted to just take this opportunity um, to introduce Asley Mildred. Uh, I was, I'm not sure if she is on the line right now. Um, Asley is a proud citizen of the Kwantlen Dun First Nation uh, in Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory and now calls uh, Campbell River her home. Uh, she's a great part-time um, asset to our solid waste management team here in our ongoing engagement and support of uh, the First Nations communities. Uh, and she'll be working uh, directly with um, Sarah and the rest of our team here in communicating our solid waste management uh, process to the First Nations, um, continue building relations and uh, identifying opportunities to provide on the ground support uh, to the First Nation communities. And so she's gonna be a really critical uh, support uh, as we work through this as always management renewal process. Um, yeah, and moving on, uh, we are gonna be doing uh, continued again, advocacy work to the provincial and uh, federal uh, agencies uh, to continue to promote our, um, sorry, increase our accessibility to uh, extended producer responsibility uh, policies. Uh, this is a very uh, important part of our uh, work to ensure that there is um, reasonable access uh, to not uh, to all of the communities, not just uh, the urban uh, centers here within uh, Colmox, Courtney, Campbell River, and Cumberland, but also to ensure that there is that reasonable access to our uh, more rural communities. Um, Moving on, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of continued partnerships with uh, Ocean Legacy. Uh, this is a pilot that was approved last year, and we are uh, going to be continuing this, this program uh, to collect and manage uh, the ocean plastics that is uh, collected on our shores and to ensure that they're properly managed and recycled. Um, and the new bylaw 720 tip B uh, that was updated. Uh, last year. Uh, this came into full effect uh, January 1st of this year, and uh, a lot of our focus is going to be, it, well, for the, at least for the first half of 2023, uh, it's going to be really focused on educating residents and businesses on the this update and its implications uh, with a bit of a more, um, more of the enforcement coming in the latter half of this year. Uh, and again, the intention is to uh, drive the necessary behaviors that we want to see uh, at the landfill to encourage diversion to minimize that waste that's actually being uh, landfilled. Um, and the, the last four, sorry, there's the illegal dumping uh, education, which uh, has been ongoing for quite some time and we are seeing great success in that. Uh, so it's gonna be a continue, uh, continuing of that education, as well as uh, the company community cleanups. Uh, those two kind of go hand in hand. And then uh, the last two under this objective is the establishment of uh, the recycling depots on Quadra and on, in, Oyster, uh, in Oyster River. Uh, those two are uh, in, in different phases, but uh, are well underway. Uh, and then moving on to objective two, uh, which is the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are two main uh, key priorities that staff are working on. Uh, the one being the landfill gas, um, or sorry, pursuing the uh, the work with uh, Fortis to, to pursue the uh, beneficial use of the landfill gas at our Cumberland facility, and also in doing the uh, feasibility work um, at our Campbell River facility to see where we can um, advance that project. And last but not least, uh, the, the regional organics um, facility, which has been uh, ongoing since, or the better half of the last decade uh, with, a, with a new pilot starting back in 2013 in Cumberland and Comox. Uh, this has been a long time in the making. So um, we start, initially started the rollout um, last week with the delivery of all the bins to the city of Courtney and we're moving on to Comox today, uh, moving on to Campbell River next week and uh, Campbell River th thereafter. So it is an exciting project uh, and make, just again, creating awareness for 
this much needed uh, program and encouraging residents to divert their food waste in our community. Uh, and then for objective three, uh, the environmentally compliant and responsible waste management, uh, there are a number of uh, key priorities under this here. Uh, one, the number one being the, just again, maintaining uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, this is in, just to make sure that we have in our ongoing operation that uh, we are meeting the, uh, the, the regulatory demands uh, as set out by the ministry. Um, and to that end, we've also done a number of capital upgrades, uh, which are going to be uh, coming to completion uh, by the end of this quarter. Um, the first one being the phase two construction of cell two at the Campbell River uh, landfill. Um, the, the cell two was uh, completed in line roughly to about 50, 45% last year, and the remaining 55% uh, will be completed um, closer to June of 2023 of this year. Uh, and then with the landfill closure up in Campbell River, uh, this has been for the most part completed with the exception of the flare, uh, which was delayed uh, due to supply chain issues, um, but it is anticipated to arrive and uh, we're hoping to have a commission by March of 2023 here. Um, and then Last but not least, uh, we've got the closure, landfill closure of uh, Tassos and Sabalis and Gold River. Uh, these are initial planning work that we're going to have to start this year to uh, initiate that work. But just to confirm, that these closures are not happening till the latter part of um, this decade, but there is significant work that needs to be done to make sure that we are um, plan do doing the necessary planning to and the public consultation that needs to happen to ensure that we are um, meeting the expectations of the community as well. And uh, yeah, for that's basically the crux of the report, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks so much. And uh, I see one light in the room, uh, Director Arbor, and then I can find out who's got hands up online. And just a moment, Dr. Arbor is nine. Yeah, thank you, Chair um, and the staff. The, obviously, uh, another busy year ahead with a lot going on. So very appreciative of all the work. Um, and I had some comments, but they'll be able to land in some of the other items. So for now, I just have a couple of feedback on the on the work plan and priorities for this coming year. Um, on the advocacy side, um, the deadline for AVICC resolution is February 9th, so it's coming up pretty quick on us. But uh, my question will be, is are there, there are things that we could consider putting forward to the province um, and to the rest of our association that you find salient or whether we're just gonna wait a year before we actually have some active resolutions that we wanna push forward? Um, and the second is, um, the um on the ocean legacy foundation uh work and um the ocean plastics depot that's been so well received um that we got involved in that space and uh, here on denman island and my other communities a lot of appreciation for that um i'm wondering if um, there would be room to start an investigation in 2023 i think we had some really embryonic discussion on that but to look at the potential to um, even scope whether we could potentially add agricultural plastics to um, to that stream uh, or to create a new stream around agricultural plastics. Um, I think I, I heard that both from the farming community at, on the campaign trail and also directly from farmers on both Hornby and Denman Island. They find that um, most of their stuff gets landfill. So it's very much the same situation as uh, as what we saw with the shellfish sector, and I see a desire to, to change that. So that's my two questions for now. Thank you for your question. Uh, the, for the, your first question about the AVICC resolution, uh, there are a couple that we are floating around, uh, one being the reasonable access, especially for, uh, sorry, with recycled BCs, uh, consultation that ended at the end of last year, there is uh, some items that we would like to bring forward. So that is definitely one that uh, is top of mind. Um, and there's currently 
uh, a review at the, at the federal level for the landfill gas regulation. And there are some pretty big ticket items that are in priority, or sorry, responsibilities that are going to be downloaded on local governments. So we are, we'll definitely put our mind to it and um, put that to circulation to, uh, to the board for consideration. Uh, sorry, and then for your next question regarding the agricultural plastic, uh, this is something that staff is uh, in discussion with, um, I can't remember the organization name, but they are the EPR for organic, or sorry, um, agricultural plastics. Um, they do have different drives across different locations. Um, I believe they have, the last one they did in, in at the Cumberland facility was probably two, three years ago, two or three years ago. So we are due for another roundup. Um, so we'll be contacting them to get a cleanup event going. Um, either I can't remember if it's this year or next year, but we'll we'll get that information and I get that back to the board. Yeah, just a quick follow-up, Chair. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's good information. Uh, maybe the agricultural plastic, we could just bring more information to the board mm -hmm. when that happens. So we have, I don't think there's high awareness that mm -hmm. that happens. Mm -hmm. And on the first one, uh, because we won't have a meeting before uh, February 9th of the CSWM, um, on your first idea, I know the landfill gas issue, and I think we're already doing some advocacy. I, I, I raised it when I was uh, in Ottawa before Christmas there the unfairness to British Columbia, so to speak, for being first mover on this and that benefit benefiting from grants and Sarah has educated us on that as well. But on the first one, would it be appropriate, um, we have a three hours ahead of us, so if we could, would it be appropriate to try to craft something and see under new business if we wanna bring uh, a draft resolution uh, for the board's consideration? Um, Mr. Chair, given the short time and uh, staff's attention to the uh, matters on the agenda today, my suggestion would be that uh, Sarah and her team bring forward the possibility of a resolution. And if there is enough information that we present that to Strathcona Regional District and Comox Valley Regional District Boards for their consideration. That just gives us a little bit more time, but enables those two um, local governments to possibly consider action if we've got enough information to, to present you a, a legitimate proposal. Okay. All right. And uh, next online, we have uh, Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I like what is outlined in the report and generally I think it's pretty encompassing of the discussions that we've had in, in recent months and years. Um, one thing that um, I've noted recently and I think it ties in quite well with some of, well, with one of the items on the plan is um, just how overwhelmed the return it center is in Courtney in terms of traffic and, and volume of uh, people coming and going and that there's one day in the week where it, it is closed on the weekend, which if we're working towards a goal of um, diversion and zero waste, um, providing better access to that on, on a weekend, I think could go a long way. I think of someone, you know, throwing out an old, you know, piece of computer equipment. And if you're cleaning out your garage on a Sunday and there's really nowhere to take it, the, the temptation to, for that to wind up in, in the garbage that's being picked up at your house a couple of days later is, is way more likely. And, um, and I do know that the recycle centers um, south of here and I'm and Victoria do offer seven day a week service. So um, I, it is something that Recycle BC obviously does contract seven day a week depots. So it would be useful. Um, both and I know I note that Campbell River is only a five day a week facility, so I'm not sure. I'm I haven't visited that center, but I imagine that they are probably experiencing similar traffic issues um, to what's to what happens at the retirement center in Courtney. So, if we could add some advocacy around extended hours um, under that, in addition to expanded services in the rural and smaller communities, I think that that would um, help with our objective one as well. Ms. Sean, do you want to respond at all? Or, uh... Thank you, Director McCallum. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, there is, if there is, has been, uh, sorry, there has been an increased demand at the uh, Courtney Return of Depot, uh, given the um, the recent closure of the, uh, the one in Comox. Uh, just a quick update on that. The Comox Bottle Depot uh, has 
close its location and they have a temporary use permit that's been approved by the CBRD board at their new location on Ryan Road. Uh, but the, the it is entirely with uh, the owner at that point uh, to work through the, the building permit. Uh, but um, going back to the Courtney Depot though, uh, it is a private business um, and we can certainly work with them to, to echo those same concerns. I'm sure they they are hearing this from their community as well, but um, we will definitely uh, relay those um, desires to have them extended open, open extended hours. But again, it is a, a private operation, so we don't necessarily have operation control in, in that respect. Um, but to I, I do want to just reiterate uh, the Campbell or sorry the the uh, waste management center in Cumberland is open seven days a week, and we do have a full suite of EPR programs that uh, residents do have access to uh, to be able to dispose of uh, a wide range of materials, uh, including the electronics, paints, hazardous waste, and things of that nature. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I am aware that the the landfill is also a site, but um, you know, realistically, um, for for people living in the East Courtney the expectation of having waste driven up to the landfill on a Sunday when we could just have a little bit easier access in and around town to me makes a lot more sense and is probably going to serve our interests in, in having more waste diverted. So if there is a way to, to raise that issue, and yeah, I do understand that it is a little bit removed from our, our sphere of control, um, but it's pretty unusual to go past the return at center and not see the parking lot somewhat overwhelmed, especially with people sorting their bottles and, and all the rest of the stuff that goes on there. So um, it seems like a fairly simple solution to increase some capacity. Um, so if that is if that is something that we can advocate for, then I'd like I'd like us to do that as well. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Director McCollum. And next in the room we have uh... Alternate Director of Wells. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, th thanks, Councillor McCollum, for, for your comments. Um, and uh, maybe just for, um, uh, as was mentioned uh, with the private businesses, um, the uh, the Return It Centre in Courtney um, also owns the land adjacent. There's a, a lot there. So they're working through uh, with, with city staff right now, actually expansion um, uh, possibilities. So that's, you know, but that's, years in the making, but uh, at least there's sort of, sort of some baby steps happening right there. Um, uh, I also uh, am fortunate that I have a child that works there, so I have a little bit of information um, in terms of, uh, of the impacts, uh, and they were uh, beyond capacity actually prior to the Comox uh, location closing, which uh, so that they were actually uh, closed on Sundays, but uh, sometimes working on Sundays just to catch up and uh, so that, you know, they, they could be ready to go on a, on a Monday rather than kind of still being in catch up mode. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so certainly uh, I, I think everybody's sort of waiting with bated breath uh, for the, uh, the Comox location to, to reopen. Um, uh, that being said, you know, I, I, I can say, uh, getting a lot of people, uh, um, uh, I think, again, to Councilor McCollum's point, um, wanting other locations. And I, I think I mentioned in, in the previous meeting or, or the one before that about, you know, for looking at having um, locations where people can have drop off, um, which we had before in, uh, in the Comox Valley. Uh, and those were closed down because of uh, contamination issues. But if there is the possibility of of looking at the opportunities to to have other uh, drop off locations, again, um, it's one thing for the Courtney location to expand. But again, it's it's a finite amount of space um, at, at the end of the day. And so, um, and uh, I'm you know very excited to see uh, you know sort of managed. Uh, drop-off centers, uh, and so would love to see something like that in Courtney for sure. Um, my my first question, I sorry, I got a little diverted with Councillor McCollum's comments here, but uh, um, on the uh, education uh, side of things and communication side of things, uh, which actually does, uh, I was going to uh, tie that into the return and center um, because it can be confusing for some people. 
um, when you think of all the things that we can re be recycled, yet not everything can be recycled in your home. So if we're talking um, things like foam and, and uh, packaging, those kinds of things, which can be recycled at the return at center, but not uh, in, your, um, in your home recycling. And just as we're talking about that education and communication, um, looking at those opportunities to work with the return at center to make sure that um, they're part of that conversation and, and we're, we're helping, you know, get people going in, uh, to the right direction. And, um, and, and also I just want to thank the chair who stopped by and we did a little bit of a video on, on the organics. And, uh, I think, uh, again, very positive, um, uh, to see how the organics it's taken a few years from my perspective, but, uh, uh, it's really awesome to see that going. And so, uh, again, just trying to, um, amplify, um, and really get that message out about how to recycle again, so that can extend the lifespan of our, uh, very expensive landfill. Great. Thanks, Mayor, Mayor Wells. I'm just going to, Devine, if you want to. Thank you okay. for those comments. Uh, in regards to the education component, it is something that we are uh, really working towards uh, in partnership with the city staff. Um, who has been really great, gracious in working with us to get our feedback and so that we can work directly with our community educators to, to get that messaging out there. As part of the uh, CSWM uh, or regional organics rollout, we really are trying to use uh, and plug the use of the Recollect app as well uh, so that people can use that as a source or as, as a tool to at, at, the, at the tip of their finger, or sorry, at, the, at their disposal to be able to find where to dispose of certain any type of material, including foam, plastics, any type of items that that can be uh, put onto our database. This is a tool that we're going to be widely um, advertising, so that people are, are continuing to use that as a resource. Um, sorry, what was the name of that app? I sorry, I, I wasn't aware of it, and and I'm kind of geeky, so. I believe it's called Courtney Collects. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Courtney Collects. Sorry. I know it quite well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think it really articulates necessarily where people can take things, mm -hmm. though, like if it was home or packaging, but maybe I'll I'll take another gander at it and I'll maybe, I, I know some city staff that I can. It's either called to. What Goes Where or The Waste Wizard. Um, different communities call it different things, but it's a really great database that people, you can put plug in. Uh, what your item is, and it'll return a mm -hmm. series of results as to where you can just properly dispose of the material. And mm -hmm. uh, so this is an app that uh, City of Courtney has already had in place for a couple of years now, I believe, and Campbell oh, yeah. River started last July, and uh, we're currently working to establish our database, piggybacking off of the great work that uh, the, the uh, city staff uh, in both those communities have done. Um, and Comox, town of Comox will be piggybacking off of that and uh, Village of Cumberland and uh, our Voiced in Service under the CBRD banner uh, will also be uh, launching ours uh, in the next, within the next quarter. Excellent. That, that's great to hear. And yeah, the Courtney Collects app has been uh, really excellent in terms of um, uh, the information that it has. Uh, and also uh, on that reminder side, especially like we saw a huge uptick with add a day just because uh, that, that caused some confusion for people who'd been on the same day for decades uh, to, to finally change. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and uh, so one is the education component that, that I was talking about. And of course, uh, I'll probably keep talking about the convenience side of things as well, um, just because that's another, you know, trying to remove those barriers as much as possible. Thank you, Chair, for letting me to talk so long. Not a problem at all. And there was actually a helpful comment by uh, one of our staff on the chat. I'm not sure the people in the room probably can't see that. But uh, Stephanie Valda was just saying that the um, the board's reuse subsidy policy also allows drop off of material to the Salvation Army and Habitat for Humanity. And they're registered to accept EPR materials like appliances and electronics. And uh, she also points out that it's a benefit because the money goes back into the community. So that's just one more option if your uh, return at center happens to be closed. And I think uh, there are a couple of people waiting online, but before that we had, okay. Uh, I believe the first person to put their hand up online was Director Morin. Great, thank you, Chair. 
<laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, certainly, the the organics is a is a great news story, and there are many people in Courtney who are thrilled about it. Um, but I do want to mention that we we certainly also have people who are disappointed um, in terms of um, you know the multi residential and and other folks who are who are not able to participate in that. And as well, um, we've had a lot of calls from from those folks around our regular uh, waste pickup and having to go to private contractors, which has had mixed reviews in terms of the satisfaction there. Um, so the other thing that's come up is institutional um, institutions and and the organics as well. So. Um, I don't want to rain on the parade because it's a wonderful story, but we are getting some comments around, you know, you're trying to promote um, diversion, but you're not including a huge, uh, huge number of people who would actually love to be able to put out their organics and don't have the ability to use it in a garden or something like that. Um, so I don't know if I know we're we're in early days and and everything's going to be evaluated as we go. But I just wondered if you could offer some comments on that, even in terms of a long term um, plan going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your direct. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the way that the bylaw seven twenty is written right now, it is intended just for the food, uh, commingle food and yard waste, uh, intended for municipal curbside contractors only. Um, but it does have the a, a caveat that it may include other sources uh, as authorized by the manager or the senior manager of CSWM. Uh, and the intention of that was really to provide us with the operational, um, the utmost operational control uh, as we start up this, the commission of this new facility. Uh, it's we're gonna have a brand new contractor and the intent is that um, the operator can control so that we can control that feedstock, which is right now is limited to single family homes where we have a bit more control over through our municipal partners uh, and their uh, respective curbside contracts. Um, so under our OMAR permit uh, that we are working on, there's a lot of scrutiny from the ministry in regards to the feedstock or what's considered acceptable um, uh, levels of contamination and, and specifically the resulting end product uh, to meet the level of con con uh, contaminants that, contain that is contained within. So we are obviously thrilled that there is um, an overwhelming positive uh, response from the community and we're certainly excited to bring everyone on board uh, onto this new program. But we do need to be mindful of the resources um, from an oversight perspective. Uh, it is a, uh, even in established programs, uh, the, the multifamilies, the commercial, industrial and uh, institutional sectors uh, tend to be plagued with a bit, a lot more contamination. And we want, to, again, that's more due to the lack of accountability uh, in those, uh, unfortunately in those sectors. And I want, don't want to paint them all with the same brush, but that is the general tr information that we do have. Um, so that is our hesitation to onboard that sector at this time. Uh, our biggest priority and focus for 2023 is to commission this facility. Uh, we want to be able to, just have it humming along perfectly before we start introducing these other variables. Um, but having said that, uh, the as I noted, uh, the um, the bylaws written in such a way that we have that uh, ability to be able to onboard other programs uh, to consider future inclusions, uh, or ability to take on one type one time type events or pilots. Um, and it is something that we are looking at uh, to. But we would need to, we're working through that model of something that would potentially include um, an ambassador or somebody that can champion the program within the building or the school uh, to ensure that level of oversight um, so that we can uh, limit the amount of contamination that's coming uh, in the feedstock. So it is coming, but uh, probably not. We'll, we'll work through that initial plan and uh, have something more more fulsome to the board towards the end of this year. Great, thank you. Just a very quick follow up to that. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and you know, maybe there's an opportunity as we you know get some time under under our belt 
uh, to pilot a couple areas, like you said, because you, you brought up schools, which of course we have these amazing little ambassadors in our in our schools and and you know some of them do have community gardens which is great that they can use that comp that compost but um you know we just have some real keeners out there um and uh yeah and the institutional piece as well but again this might be a um an appropriate thing to to put out a bit more communication on the rationale for that um because I don't think that, that that was necessarily communicated to those um, to those folks, uh, the reason, uh, you know, around the contamination issues. So maybe that's something that we could put out a bit more information on. Thanks. All right, thanks very much. And we're just going to the next speaker online. We have uh, alternate director, it's either Tayson or Tayson, and you can tell me which one it is. Sure, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm new here. It's uh, Tyson. Uh, like Tyson, thank you. Very confusing. Um, yeah, I just had a reflection, not sure exactly where this fits in, but um, in my community of Cortez Island uh, over the past number of years we've actually found at our transfer station quite a decline in some of the uh, reuse of materials there was quite a strong culture of sort of scavenging and repurposing of uh, especially the uh, scrap metal part of uh, collection that was happening there and i think mostly for safety reasons that has changed and just want to throw it out there maybe here that um, it would be great to revisit that and see what sort of other balanced approaches we might find for getting people access to some of the resources that they are able to reuse. The end. Um, thank you for your question. It is, uh, you're, you're correct. It, it, there is that liability component. Um, it is something that uh, we came across with the Hornby service as well. At the, um, we, there, we do need to understand the liability component, but we will definitely take a look, a closer look with uh, the operator, or the, the contractor, uh, to see where we can limit those risks and uh, while balancing that, uh, that need for, for increased diversion as well. Thanks. Uh, did you have a follow-up to Tyson? No, that sounds great. I'd be pleased to work with all the team players on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And next, coming back to the room, we have uh, Director Kettler. Thank you, Chair. So um, I haven't been at this board for a while. I'm the alternate from Cumberland. And um, so apologize if the boards received this information recently, but uh, We've been waiting, um, flaring our gas at the landfill for quite a long time, waiting to uh, to collect that gas for it to be turned into uh, renewable natural gas. Um, so it does say that uh, we're in the finalizing agreement stage, which I think we've been in for a while. So just wanted to know if you have um, any more information, uh, a firmed up uh, date on that at all. Thank you for that question. It is, uh, it, you're absolutely correct. There has been, and it has been in a finalized stage for quite some time. Um, when we were in, at this point in September of 2021, uh, we, we believe that we were really close. Um, but unfortunately, on the other side, uh, there was a, um, a new roster of folks that came on to the, the agreement and uh, there was a complete overhaul on the agreement so we've had to really cope it was really getting back to the drawing board and but uh by the end of last year we have um come to what we believe to be a fairly close agreement uh, with the dollar value that uh, is acceptable to the board um which has already been covered um, in previous report, and we can provide that uh, information to to the directors to ensure that everybody is on the same page. Um, but we're hopeful to be able to to have a sign off by um, within the next few months here. Sorry, within the next year. 
uh, within the next few months. Within the next few months. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And next, uh, I have a question from Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I wasn't going to come back to the mic, but Director Moray's comments really resonated with me around the uh, multi-residential and institutional and commercial. And I'm not sure, I oh, actually, I, I don't believe that the ambassador approach is going to be the way to actually have scaled impact. Um, I know a few of those places intimately, and I assure you that even in the city of Courtney, a lot of places, everything goes in the book garbage, including the recycling. They just don't have those, those a lot of those multi-residential or whatever. They just don't provide the facilities at all for recycling. And, um, and so everything goes in the garbage. Um, and I... I believe we should look at if as part of solid waste management plan, if we should impose for all of those to become part of the municipal systems and that we take over a collection and methods. So that would be a next level ambition in the solid waste management plan. Low level is ambassador and pilots and the rest of it. And I think we'll probably just impact five to 10% of the market over the next 10 years if we go that route. Everything is, is dealt with by private contractors and it's lowest cost and lowest hassle for those facilities. So I, I think if we want to uh, bring change, we should think about it now while we're doing the solid waste management plan. Thanks. Thank you for those comments. Um, the, uh, yes, the ambassador program is on a more voluntary basis and the, in, in the longer term, it is something that we want to explore as part of the Solid Waste Management Plan. There are different policy tools that we can uh, potentially leverage, uh, one being the mandatory source separation uh, bylaw that uh, legislation that uh, the RDN, for example, is uh, championing right as we speak. Uh, so if what, if that legislation does become, uh, that does pass, it is a, a policy tool that um, we can explore and look at. And if there's endorsement from the board, something that we can explore as part of the solid waste management plan as well. All right, uh, next is a question online from uh, Director Davis. Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, waste to energy. I know there is supposed to be some explorations going on around that. I think Charlie Cornfield was leading it in the past. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there's any new information there, if anything's moved forward. And the second one is uh, e-waste. I'm just wondering how effectively we're handling e-waste and uh, where does it go and how is it processed? Thanks. Okay, I'll pass that direct to Vivian Shaw. Thank you so much. Uh, for the waste to energy uh, conversation, we have uh, an agreement with the Cowichan Valley, the regional district of Nanaimo uh, and ourselves uh, to monitor, uh, sustain uh, once they've completed, a, or sorry, once they've reached um, full operation. Uh, the last conversation that we had with them was actually back in September of 2021. Um, we have attempted to contact them on a few different occasions, uh, but to no avail, unfortunately. Uh, we know that they are still in operations, um, uh, but they seem to have focused uh, their attention on uh, another community. Um, but we do, uh, we are continuing to try to understand where they stand, but uh, based on the last conversation that we've had uh, just very recently, um, they have not reached uh, the full operational uh, requirements that was set out in our agreement so that we can start monitoring. Um, but we, as soon as we have more information, we'll be able to bring that back to uh, the, the board. Uh, in regards to the electronics uh, waste uh, that we do uh, collect at our facilities, uh, I don't have the specific numbers, but um, I, we do have uh, Stephanie Feldell who is on the line. Um, she, not to put her on the spot, but if she might be able to have a bit more information regarding the specifics on the tonnages and uh, the processing of that material. So I, I do know that the majority of the material stays in North America. It's not distributed overseas. As far as the material specifically collected in Tassis, it's 
brought to the Campbell River Return It Depot for recycling. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, um, regarding waste to energy, it sounds like we've this has been going on for I, I think four years um, regarding sustain. Is there not any other waste to energy facilities that are effectively operating that we should be looking at? Because it, I only ever hear about this one and it never seems to be coming up to speed. So I'm just wondering if we should be broadening our research. Um, Mr. Chair, I can answer that. And uh, the, uh, the previous board did extensive consideration of waste to energy options. They did a request uh, for uh, uh, qualifications from a number of different providers across North America. And with that, narrowed it down to the sustained model as the one to consider being potentially the most practical for solutions here. And uh, so with that direction, a budget was set and a, uh, a system of evaluating sustain was developed and, and agreed to by the board. We're just waiting for that full operational period to commence so that that evaluation can take place. In the meantime, staff have undertaken no other consideration to other proposals. We were following through with the uh, the other um, projects and needs with respect to the service. And uh, as Vivian said, as soon as we have something to report on you and hope to you in terms of uh, the, the productivity and potential of sustain in their operations in Chester, we will provide that to you. Great, okay. thanks, yeah. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks, Director Davis. And uh, coming back to the room, uh, Director Greve. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, I'm going to swing back to uh, some discussion around um, our legislative authority over waste. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we have that authority when it comes to ICI and things like that. I understand uh, my memory serves me correctly that Metro tried to impose, impose that uh, and the, uh, the ministry or the courts overturned it that uh, private uh, facilities uh, can uh, truck all their waste to the to uh, Washington State to the, the cheapest possible way to dispose of it. And maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but Nanaimo as well, I think um, uh, my understanding is a lot of the institutions and, and commercial operations still take it and put it on a barge and take it over to Washington State because it's the cheapest possible option. So I just... Uh, ask, uh, has something changed? Do we actually have control over our own waste stream? Because my understanding is, according to the province, we do not. Thank you. Thank you for the question. The bylaw, I think it's, I can't remember the, the exact bylaw that you're referencing for Metro Vancouver, but you're right, they, uh, it was turned down back in 2014, I believe. Um, which which Metro Vancouver tried to or attempted to restrict um, assert control over its boundaries to ensure that all of the material is uh, handled within region. Um, that hasn't changed um, to my understanding. Uh, and but I do not believe that to your point about the regional district of Nanaimo, they are proposing something similar but on a different slightly different. They want to be able to incent resident, or sorry, the businesses to keep the material within its boundaries by providing a financial incentive. Uh, there's a different uh, levy model that they're they're exploring right now, but uh, they're not trying to res restrict the boundaries per se. All right, thanks, you. And we have one more question in the room. Um, Alternate Director Wells. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just thought I'd follow up on the, the waste energy. I was on the committee for about four years, um, 2014 to 2018, and then as uh, Chair of uh, and co eventually co-chair of the uh, Solid Waste, um, we spent uh, considerable time on this. We actually, uh, during an FCM conference, uh, visited uh, the sustain system in Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, um, and even though it was supposed to be up and running a, a year prior to us getting there, it still wasn't commissioned. Um, and uh, and in regards to other uh, waste energy uh, folks, uh, we reached out to many of them, but most of the ones in North America 
um, had either gone bankrupt uh, or had been taken over by their local governments uh, because of uh, inability to uh, like all sorts of issues around environmental impact. So it, it, it's very challenging. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like a simple thing, but it's, it's much more challenging than, than it might uh, otherwise seem. Okay, thanks very much, uh, uh, Alternate Director Wells. We have one more question, uh, Director Tyson online. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, just a reflection on the discussion around uh, multifamily units and commercial waste pickup and the increased risk that that brings for contaminations in organics collection. And just reflecting on the on the fact that organics in our landfill could well be considered a contamination of the landfill, resulting in contamination of the atmosphere and I would be curious to see, you know, how how the contamination issue sort of um, looks when we when we take that perspective, and whether the remedy for contaminations in our organics composting might be easier to deal with than, uh, as well as perhaps a less imminent threat to society than the contamination uh, in the atmosphere. Those are some thoughts. Maybe a big topic, but just getting it out there. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. We uh, we certainly do not want to continue to have organics coming to the landfill, and we want to build a system that can take as much of it as possible. And that will come in time. Um, with respect to um, the operations of our organics facility, and then the marketing of that product. It is a matter that is under highly intensive scrutiny by the province. You're all probably familiar or aware of those many facilities operated by, by independents and private business that have just gone awry or gone astray, and there's been dramatic problems. Because of that, the ministry really focuses a lot of attention on the standards and requirements of these facilities. I think uh, once ours is up and running and you see how it is operated and run and the extent that we've gone to and in investing in equipment that ensures that uh, all the requirements are met, you'll see that uh, that it's a, it's a fair investment and a fair amount of detail goes into every aspect to ensure that we do not contribute to pollution of the, uh, of the air in the facility and that the eventual end product is something that we can count on to, to market and provide for people to use in their gardens where they are growing their food. And, and other things. Thanks, yeah. Uh, Director Tyson, did you have a follow up to that? Yeah, that that sounds really uh, great. And so we do have systems that can filter out a certain amount of contamination. And it sounds like the the regulatory environment is almost stricter regarding composting than it is. Um, regarding methane emissions from landfill, is that is that part of the issue, and maybe somewhere that we might put some adv advocacy pressure on? Um, I think it's all good, and I think that there is uh, definitely attention to to methane and our needs to to manage that as well. It's just that um, really the, the management of the end product that we have depends a lot on preventing contamination, ensuring that the source is, is good at the, uh, at the supply end of things. And that will help us to achieve our, our objectives and the needs and, and meet the regulatory requirements. So I just want to assure you and all the directors that it is our intention to roll out and develop programs that get I ICNI into the system, but it will just take, take a little bit of time and we need to prove ourselves in these first stages to, to go to the next step. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tyson, any, any, any further uh, follow-ups? You're welcome to one more if you wish. That's great, thanks. Okay, great, thanks very much. Uh, so that's been a great discussion. There is a recommendation if someone wants to move that. Oh, sorry, still on receipt, so we'll just uh, take care of that. So uh, anyone opposed to receipt? Great. Okay. And the recommendation? Move Arbor it. Omar. Uh, I'm gonna, Director Morin and then uh, Director Arbor. And anyone opposed? Excellent. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the uh, financial proposed financial plan for 2023 to 2027. And with that, I'll pass it over to CAO. Thank you. Receipt and then Grieve and Arbor. 
Thank you, Chair and Directors. And back to Vivian again to present the proposed financial plan. And uh, she and finance staff are here to, to answer any questions you may have with respect to it. Thank you so much, Russell, and through the chair to the, C, uh, to the CAO, to the chair and the CSW on board. Um, this is our financial plan for 2023 to 2027. Um, this is, a, a, again, just a quick uh, service overview. Uh, you would have seen the slide as part of the inaugural board back in November of last year, but we wanted to just bring this one back up uh, quickly to provide that context for this uh, financial plan discussion, just to illustrate the vast area that the CSWM service covers, uh, supports and provide waste collection, and uh, transportation and disposal services. Um, this area spans nearly about 20,000 uh, square kilometers uh, from Cayucat uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island, uh, across to Cortez, Denman, Hornby, Quadra, uh, Discovery Islands, and all the way down to Fanny Bay, including uh, portions of the British Columbia main coast just north of um, Powell River. So this is, again, this is a really busy slide, but uh, this is really, again, just to illustrate um, the the breadth of services that we uh, own, operate, or have con uh, contract services for. Um, and furthermore, like we are responsible for the operation, the maintenance, and the annual reporting compliance of uh, five historical landfills, uh, the construction, operation, and the maintenance of um, the, the regional landfill in Campbell, or sorry, in Cumberland, as well as the leachate treatment plant and the landfill gas collection system. Uh, there's also the uh, the closure cost uh, and environmental liability of all the historical landfills, uh, a lot of uh, diversion programs, including drywall, uh, wood waste, uh, recycled BC depots, and um, hazardous household waste um, materials, as well as the unified transportation for all the communities with uh, transfer stations. So all of this is reflected in the financial plan that uh, is before you. Uh, as we had already just briefly covered over uh, in the previous report, uh, this service is really guided by the Solid Waste Management Plan, uh, which is supported by an, an annual uh, roundtable session, um, which is scheduled for September of this year. Uh, and this is really to ensure that our priorities as staff um, are continuing to meet the expectation of uh, the CSWM board. And uh, I think we've kind of gone through it in, in great detail in the previous report, so I won't uh, I won't belabor the point. But there are a number of uh, really great examples of the work that has been done over the past few years to achieve these objectives. Uh, the first objective being uh, the minimization of waste. Again, we've kind of gone through some of these. So. Um, yeah, the continued uh, education and promotion advocacy work, uh, the, the work that we're doing at uh, the Quadra and Oyster River depots, um, the introduction of organics uh, for uh, objective two, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are the initiatives that we have uh, highlighted and um, yeah, there's just a lot of really great work that uh, staff has been working on to address these uh, objectives that have been approved by the board. This is uh, an opportunity for us to just toot our own horns. Uh, this is the, the work upon, uh, work plan accomplishments uh, for 2022. Um, we just wanna highlight some of these uh, key projects that uh, have been completed or on its way. Um, the first one being the regional organics facility in Campbell River uh, that is uh, nearing completion. Uh, the organics uh, transfer station uh, that's being built in Cumberland, uh, the Campbell River closure, of the old historical landfill, construction of uh, the cell two, um, the new the new cell within the engineered landfill in Campbell River. Uh, we started the uh, solid waste management plan renewal process starting last June, and uh, we'll get an update from Sarah Willie here shortly uh, after this report. Um, the passing and uh, the sorry the adoption of a bylaw seven twenty, which is really going to be. 
uh, our mechanism to be able to start to enforce those necessary behaviors that we want to see at the landfill to divert waste. Um, I've established another Ocean Legacy Depot at the uh, Cumberland facility and, uh, and, and working with the municipal partners to uh, roll out the, the organics uh, program. So diving right into the 2023 budget, uh, this is the summary on, sorry, this is uh, the summary uh, budget that is, or sorry, summary of the budget that's uh, within your report. Um, starting with the tax requisition, uh, in the way of background, the tax requisition was actually brought up uh, to the $6 million mark back in 2019 uh, to meet the ongoing uh, capital funding needs of the CSWM service. Um, as you're all aware, COVID has had an unprecedented uh, economic impact to the communities across uh, across the world, um, and the CSWM service uh, area is no different. And uh, during that time, there was an opportunity to review the solid waste service, determine if uh, the service levels and capital project priorities at that time uh, continue to match the need and capacity of uh, the community. So to that end, uh, CS, or sorry, the CSWM board was uh, presented with uh, an action plan for 2020 and a, a bit of a renewal concept uh, to provide that much needed financial relief to its residents um, in light of ongoing challenges during that time. So this included a line by line uh, review of the operational budget to identify any um, efficiencies or opportunities to reduce costs, um, both immediately and in the long term. And then for the capital budget, similar, similarly, uh, there was a review of uh, the project requirements and timing and project funding and how things were um, allocated. Uh, so in the end, uh, there was uh, the service shaped off of roughly about, a, I think, a million dollars in tax requisition uh, for the 2021 financial plan, and it was maintained for 2022. Um, as presented in the last year's budget, and as we are presenting here now, uh, the we had proposed a, a step increase in 2023 and 2024 um, from the five million to the 5.5 million to kind of start to build up that uh, annual tax requisition back up to the 6 million uh, by 2025 in order to adequately meet uh, the ongoing capital demands uh, and funding needs of the CSWM service so that we are going to hopefully avoid a significant adjustment at the end of 2025. Uh, from a revenue standpoint, the uh, solid waste tipping fee uh, was approved by through bylaw 720 uh, to increase by $5 per ton to the new rate of uh, $145 per ton starting in January of this year. Uh, the uh, again, this is uh, this was to match the uh, CPI increases, and this was approved by the board um, back in 2019 as well. Uh, as part of this revenue, uh, there is the new organic tip fee um, that will be that was implemented as of January 1st. Uh, this is $110 per ton with the commissioning of the new organics facility. Uh, and then for on the expenditure line, uh, overall, the expenditures have decreased by roughly about $770,000. Uh, and this is primarily due to the closure of the Campbell River landfill and uh, its um, contracted services. And this decrease is offset by the increase in waste volumes and the associated transportation cost um, from Campbell River Waste Management Center and its uh, uh, the more rural communities. And for the personnel cost, uh, and this is something we'll dive a bit more into the next slide, but uh, overall the, the personnel cost, sorry, the personnel costs are Proposed to increase by 8%. Uh, this amounts to just shy of 250,000 uh, in 2023. And this is uh, due to uh, the, con the scheduled contractual wage increases uh, per our collective uh, QP, QP collective agreement. 
uh, some of the provisions for the job grading reviews and uh, the addition of one full-time um, term operator position uh, for two years. Uh, and the, uh, the intention for this position is to manage the new active phase in uh, cell two. Uh, some of the increases that some of the other increases that we're seeing op, uh, on the operational line item um, is uh, again related to uh, the increase in waste volume and the associated transportation costs uh, in the Campbell River and again some of the rural communities. Um, there are some, a few minor capital projects, and uh, we have included some provisions in there for. Uh, the installation of uh, four electric uh, charging stations at uh, the Campbell, or sorry, at the Cumberland facility. Uh, that we have facility improvements uh, for uh, the compost uh, site in Sabalas. Uh, we've got some improvements at uh, Cort Cortez and Hornby Island depots as well, and there are uh, some minor capital improvements uh, slated for the two waste management centers in Campbell River and Cumberland as well. Um, with Capital, uh, there's a lot that's shown on the page eight of your report. Uh, those are mostly carryovers from 20, the 2022 approved budget. And we're gonna be closing out a number of these projects in early 2023. Uh, post 2022, uh, the capital spending is really uh, projected to drop, start to drop off significantly with um, smaller closure projects and uh, the construction of transfer stations uh, occurring in Tassas, Sabalas, uh, and Gold River in the latter part of this decade. Um, but all of the, these require uh, community consultation and engineering designs to be able to hone in on that uh, cost estimates. Uh, yeah, a bit, uh, one of the biggest ones is, uh, towards the end of uh, 2023 is um, the, the construction of cell three. Um, and that is based on the estimated fill plan and the cell two estimates. And that is uh, that that's got a placeholder of roughly about $10 million. This is uh, the new staff position that we're proposing for uh, 2023. Um, this is directly tied to the management of the new active phase in uh, cell two in uh, Cumberland, at the Cumberland facility. Uh, so in early 2023, uh, the opera operations will, will be opening up uh, cell two, um, and we're going to be padding out that bottom uh, liner with select way. So uh, it's what we call the squishier waste coming from the municipal curbside trucks. It's the municipal household garbage from the, the residential sector. Um, while we're still, the intention is that we're going to continue to operate cell one with the management of the construction and demolition materials. Um, and that has, we, we want to be able to make sure that we segregate that those sources to make sure that we're not damaging the, the liner. So the proposed uh, position that uh, is before you, it's an additional operator to so that we can operate both cells uh, simultaneously. And uh, we're proposing that uh, this uh, position is uh, for a two-year term uh, while we pad out cell two. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to really highlight um, the role of this operator. Uh, it's very critical in our operation and uh, the cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness of uh, the operation. I, I do want to stress, even with the additional full transfers that are coming in from Campbell River, uh, the crew has um, has increased their daily tonnage from roughly about 105 tons per day uh, to 184 tons per day. But with uh, the the increase focused on the compaction ratios, we've been able to maintain that same level of compaction at 0 0.32 uh, tons per cubic uh, meter compared to 0 0.56 tons uh, per cubic meter back in 2020. So to put this into perspective, I just have a little bit of math at the, at the bottom of the slide to just really illustrate the cost savings uh, that we, that is, afforded by having this uh, uh, this uh, operator working through working the ways to be able to make sure that they, there is a significant uh, in the three to five passes that's required to needed to be able to maintain this compaction ratio. So 
uh, again, to put this into perspective, so this is using a, an airspace volume of roughly about 90,000 cubic meters, which is what it would normally take to house um, 45,000 tons of material. Uh, as an example, um, the difference in the revenue that's gained from that compaction different, that differential in a single year equates to $2.2 million in additional revenue. So this is just having someone in the seat making the necessary passes over the waste um, to provide that uh, additional airspace. So this proposed operator position, again, is critical to our operations to, to continue to push that uh, compaction ratio to maintain the airspace required uh, to prolong the life of our landfill. Um, and again, like as the CSW and board have iterated from time over and over again, it is a, it is a finite resource and we place a significant importance in that, in extending the life of this uh, uh, landfill here. Um, this proposed operator will also be used to execute diversion activities, which are continually being added. Uh, we're looking at other opportunities, we're potentially looking at high grading right at the landfill so that we can pluck out those easier to, to, uh, to reach materials so that we can divert. Um, all of this, uh, again, incrementally adds to the, the uh, operator's workload. Um, we want to be able to use this operator to kind of build a bit more resiliency within the team um, over the next while. So this is how we pay for the service. Uh, the, the revenue that is uh, coming in for the CSWM service really primarily comes from two sources, uh, tipping fee and taxation uh, being the two key uh, portions as you'll see in the graph. So the tipping fee covers the use of the facilities and the requisition is uh, used to pay for the capital infrastructure that's needed. So for 2023, the revenue for the, the revenues for the CSWM service is mainly derived from a tip fees. It amounts to roughly about 60%. And the tax requisition uh, is uh, accounts for roughly about 30% with a balance um, from other revenues and resources and prior year surplus and carry forwards. Uh, as noted earlier, the tip fee for organics, uh, sorry, for municipal solid waste um, has increased from $140 per ton to $145 per ton for 2023. And the tip fee for organics has been implemented at $110 per ton for our municipal partners. On the tax requisition side, uh, again, but based on what we had talked about earlier, the, the 2020 COVID-19 renewal and response, uh, sorry, response and renewal action plan, the tax requisition was uh, reduced from the 6 million in 2021 um, down to 20 to the $5 million mark starting in 2021. And this was uh, at that time, it's just projected to remain at this level for five years, but as we were updating our capital plan and projections for the last year with that 10 year outlook, uh, the detail reviewed really showed that this reduction was not sustainable uh, over the course of the five year uh, time frame. So in order to adequately uh, fund the capital intensive projects that uh, we have already completed our, and are coming in the coming years, uh, the financial modeling shows that it's necessary to consider that step increase back up to the $5.5 million mark for 2023, um, 5 point to 5.8 in 2024, and then back up to the 6 million in 2025. Thanks, Vivian. I've noticed there's a question from alternate director Wells. Are you okay to take a question or two along the way? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think it's a, a fairly simple one. I, I just I didn't see in the report um, the Recycle BC, which was on the previous slide on on the pie. It was a very small slice of the pie, but I just wondered with that Recycle BC revenue, if that's sort of like an in and out, like is it earmarked for something specific, or um, uh, sort of what the Recycle BC, like how that revenue works? Is that us giving them stuff and getting paid for it, or no, the so we get uh, to oh, sorry our revenue uh, from Recycle BC uh, is 
based on the uh, the material that we get at the depot, and it's uh, it's a it's based on a schedule that's prescribed, uh, and it's relative uh, or so it's directly correspond to the tonnage that we receive at our various depots um, approved across our CSWM service. Okay. Um, it is not necessarily potentially reflective of the, the amount of service that we provide to the community, but it, it does account for a, a small chunk of our, our revenue. Um, but I can provide you, I, I don't have it right on hand, but I can mm -hmm. provide you the exact dollar amount. And it, it does correspond with um, the revenues that uh, we, we get for each of the materials that's, uh, that flows through their system. Okay, and and you sort of alluded to what my follow up question was going to be is that if it is for recycling, does it actually pay for the the, the recycling that we're providing? And it sounds like it doesn't. It's more of a token amount versus actually paying for what it costs to recycle things. The recycle BC covers uh, the transportation, uh, so there is a it covers a lot more than what we we see as that that particular line item, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the. The more rural communities that transportation is a it, it comes at a it's an expensive line item and it is covered for any of the approved uh recycle bc locations it is covered under their their banner okay um but yeah the the monetary amounts that's covered that we do receive it's intended to pay for the staffing uh the, the oversight to again to ensure that there is the necessary um I'm sorry, the necessary oversight to to avoid the contamination so that we are meeting their um, their guidelines. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, we have another question uh, from uh, Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. I, it, it's cool that Mayor Wells brought that little point. It's been a little bit on my mind um, not having the information because the, the way, and maybe staff can correct me if I'm wrong in this analysis, but it feels like you know, um, as you say, most of the recycled BC comes from the materials that go through our depots. And I would assume that most of our uh, recycling materials does not go through our depots, but gets collected through um, the municipal collection system and goes straight to Amterra. So we go through the trouble of um, collecting funds from our residents to um, pay for collection and the rest of it. Uh, and it seems like I'd be curious to see if we look at the recycled material as a resource, are we just letting the private contractor take all the benefits from that resource? Because I imagine they resell it, all the recycling flow that they have. It's it's a question. I just don't have the information on it. And I'm sure that the volume of recycled material would be much, much higher than what goes through our depot. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so for the municipalities that are collecting curbside, uh, they receive a dollar per household from Recycle BC for that collection service. Whether that covers the cost of their private contractor or not is dependent on their own contracts. So in some cases it does, some cases it doesn't. Uh, that contractor, um, is, as I said, is sort of paid through that municipality. And then as Vivian mentioned, the transportation beyond the Cumberland MRF is covered by Recycle BC. The post-processing downstream is covered by Recycle BC. For our depots, that's where we have the contract with Recycle BC and, and at the prices per ton. And as Vivian alluded to, uh, typically that uh, reimbursement that we receive per ton for the collection services uh, unfortunately, do not cover the, the cost that it takes to staff and to site and to monitor for contamination, as well as to support the operational requirements for loading and uh, tracking all that material. So, yeah, it's uh, the private contractors themselves don't don't typically benefit greatly from that uh, collection service. All right, thanks very much. And there's also a uh, question from uh, Director Hardy. Uh, thanks. I'm just going again over the report that was provided. We have five-year revenues uh, forecasted. That, um, I, I don't see five-year forecast for expenditures. So is there something that can be pr provided to us to, to see what the expenditures are going to be over the next five years, forecast expenditures? Ms. Shaw? Okay. 
I'm sorry, um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Kevin Duval, the manager of the financial planning will respond to the question. Thank you very much through uh, the chair to the director. So yeah, I can answer that question. So if you look at Appendix A, uh, you'll see the breakdown of the uh, operational budget, both for revenues and expenditures, and that certainly details all of your operational projections for the next five years. Okay, did you have a follow-up, Director Hardy? Okay, and I see there's a question now online, uh, Director Kerr. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, staff, for your report. Um, I've got a subsequent that I've sent in on chat um, for after receipt. All right, thanks you very much. We'll uh, we'll get to that uh, once we dispense with the receipt. Thanks. Thanks. And I'll just pass it back to Ms. Shaw at this point. Thank you. Uh, so this this uh, slide here really is just to show the uh, the tax impact, um, which is based on the 2022 assessed uh, sorry revised assessment rule. So for CVRD, based on the average assessed value uh, per the BC assessment uh, that came out in January. Um, the the average home is roughly around that eight hundred thousand dollar mark uh, within Cumberland, Comox, and Courtney. Uh, so the tax impact is uh, proposed to be one hundred and two dollars and seventy seven cents, uh, and this is based on the um, sorry, it's hundred sorry, twelve cents per thousand dollars of assessed value. So for Campbell River, um, I it, we had to parse that one out uh, in the SRD region because it's, uh, it is significantly higher compared to the rest of the SRD region. Uh, for Campbell River, the, assessed va the average assessed value is in the $680,000 range and the tax impact being uh, $86.70. For the SRD uh, region where we have data for from uh, the BC assessment, um, and so this includes Tassas, Sayward, Sabalas, and Gold River. The average home in those areas are in the $250,000 mark, um, equating to a tax impact of $31.56. Uh, we don't need to obviously go into this because it was already covered in the, the previous report, but this is again, just a really quick slide just to highlight the work priorities that uh, we have um, uh, as staff uh, based on, on the basis of the strategic direction from the board as outlined in the financial plan and uh, the solid waste management plan. Uh, in the development of this uh, financial plan, we just wanted to kind of highlight some of those opportunities and challenges uh, that we saw uh, as we work through uh, each line item. Um, as you all know, given the, the current global um, economic challenges, uh, the long range of projections uh, was a bit of a challenge given the number of market trends uh, worldwide and local economic uh, uncertainties and increasing regulatory uh, obligations. And some of those key factors are um, the increasing obligation responsibilities that are continuing to, to, to be downloaded from the province. Um, it's specifically in the landfill gas management uh, area. Uh, so we really do need to make sure that we're balancing those service demands against the cost per household. And this is something that we're going to look into in much more detail as part of the salt waste management planning um, to ensure that there is that equity uh, across our service area. Uh, we are also uh, ta um, tasked with the pressure of the, our aging infrastructure um, and our asset renewal obligations um, as identified in our salt asset management plan that was presented last year. Uh, and there's a host of these challenges, so I won't belabor the point, but there's, again, a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the EPR programs from the province and uh, in, in, the, in the, the regulation in the areas of uh, managing 
uh, C and D waste uh, in its impact to our landfill um, bill plan and the TIPI projections, uh, the uptake of uh, the regional organics, because um, right now it is a voluntary, uh, it is currently voluntary at this time. So we a lot of that is entirely um, at the whim of, sorry, we do do a lot of education, but it is gonna be dependent on the uptake from the community. Um, and then last but not least, there's the uh, the cost escalation and in, uh, inflationary impacts uh, that we're continuing to see on materials, services, uh, and equipment that's used in our daily operation and the delivery of our capital infrastructure. But having said that, um, there are continuing to be a lot of opportunities uh, for our service, and we've highlighted a number of those uh, achievements that's um, that we have been able to achieve over the past decade under our, our current solid waste management plan. But uh, our focus for 2023 and onwards is to really hone in on uh, the, the waste diversion aspect as we are closing out a lot of our capital projects. Uh, and with that, um, I will turn the table back over to the board for any questions. Great, thanks so much, Vivian. And uh, I see Robin's hand going up first and then, uh, of Director Wells light, so I'll just uh, get you queued up, Robin. Go ahead. Thank you. That was uh, very informative. Thank you very much, Vivian. I am curious about a six million dollar tax requisition, and I think my curiosity really lies in uh, that it affects every taxpayer equally, regardless of their work towards personal waste reduction. And to me, somehow that seems somewhat counterproductive. And I'm curious if it could create a, we're paying for it, so we might as well use it sort of attitude among uh, ratepayers and, and uh, residents. And I'm curious if there's been any thought given to that uh, increase in requisition, sort of, uh, yeah, creating that attitude of, of entitlement to make as much waste as we want. Thank you for the question. Uh, the The tax requisition is really to um, to pay for the capital infrastructure. These are there are there are set costs that's tied to say the um, the the construction of the landfill, the the construction uh, and the maintenance of a lot of those facilities. The tipping fee that um, is outlined, so the hundred and ten forty five dollars. Those are the, the those are to cover the operational costs. So it's on a, it's you can view it as a bit of a user pay type system. So it's not in it's not intended. It will reward those that do reduce the amount of waste. It it, it is, does course it's not perfect, but it does correspond to the waste generation. <laughs> Um, Mr. Chair, if I could draw attention to the uh, the chat and the proposed resolution of uh, Director Kerr, he he, if you agree to this, will be asking staff to come back to you with you know the rationale and and uh, some background with respect to the taxation. So uh, that that would be a good report for us to show and demonstrate the history in and give you a little bit more time to understand that as well as his ask is for comparisons of other other landfills across the province too. So we could definitely, if you you adopt that, give you more background and more information on, on your question to Director Mulaney. I'd like to second Director Kerr's motion, please. I think we, uh, we're we not actually gonna make it now because we have to dispense with receipt, but we will do it as soon as receipt's done. And uh, I think I called you Robin earlier, Director Mulaney, my apologies for being overly casual. Um, we have uh, alternate Director Wells in the room. And then after that, Director McCollum online. So I will just... Uh, you up director wells thank you chair and and yeah it, it, it's always alarming to see that you know something uh, such as tipping fees which is supposed to pay for the actual usage of something not actually doing it and having to do the the tax requisition on top of that which is you know so, sort of unfortunate and and so i'm certainly happy to see those tipping fees going up um and of course the the resistance to that in the past was that if ours was higher than the adjacent regional districts, then that could end people going to another location um, or even worse, just more illegal dumping, which is, which isn't good. So, so my first question is, is uh, around whether or not we're, we're seeing an increase in illegal dumping as those tipping fees go up. I, 
uh, which I think is a pretty easy question. And the second question is very easy, I think, as well, which is um, I couldn't find an actual percentage increase. I could see dollar amounts going up and down, but not actually the final percentage increase for um, what we're asking for, just because I know that's a question I'm going to get. This job did or oh okay. sorry for giving you two questions no, at once. Sorry, I was thinking about something else. Uh thank you for your question. The illegal dumping, we we're still early uh in the year, uh, but based on the based on uh the conversation that we've had with our illegal dumping team, we haven't seen that. Um it, that five dollars per ton does not for the average load, it is not, um, most people don't reach that threshold. Like it is, I'm not saying that it's a, it's not a big amount, but it is not necessarily uh, as jarring as, as it looks. Um, but we are not uh, seeing that level of uh, illegal dumping, but we will re be reporting that out um, in, I think, March. We generally provide a an update, an annual update to the board. So we can uh, section off based on the different quarters and see if there, ha there has been an impact. Okay. Um, and for the percentage increase, I will have to defer that to uh, to Kevin Deville. I saw him with the calculator. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you very much again through the chair to the director. So, if I'm understanding, you're looking for the percentage year over year change in the tax requisition. Yeah, and understanding it went down and now it's going back up. But just just because I know that's a question I'm going to get. Absolutely. So yeah. So if you look at where we were at as of 2022, which was the five million dollar level, we are proposing that we move up to that 5.55 million uh, in 2023. That would represent about 11 percent increase, which is again trying to take us back to that that pre-COVID level. Then it's modest increases to get us back to the six million thereafter. So uh, you know, between 2023 and 2024, we'd be looking at about a four and a half percent increase. And then to get us back to that full six million, it'd be another about 3.4 percent. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, great. And uh moving to now to Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the report. Um I had some questions just around um, the additional operator. Um, I found the uh, cost benefit analysis provided very helpful. And so I just want to say I appreciate that additional context when we're talking about adding uh, another resource. Um, but one thing I can't recall clearly I, it was what what did we add for an operator last year? Was it one and a half operators in, in last year's financial plan or, or was it one? That's my first question. question. And then I'll just I'll ask my subsequent at the same time so you can just answer them together. And then um, my recollection and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the uh, additional staffing last year was in response to um, just the increase in visits to the bins and the additional, um, yeah, additional volumes that were being processed there. And I thought it was re related um, or partially related to the increase in construction and construction rates and home rentals, um, which I would assume are projected to go down significantly with um, the impending recession. And then, I'm just wanting clarification if A, my assumptions and recollections are correct, and B, whether or not there is an opportunity to reassess how much um, service that we have at those bins. If um, if there is an economic slowdown, I would assume there would be a slowdown in, in that kind of volume as well. Thanks. Thank you for the question, Director McCallum. Uh, you're right, for the 20, the, the Sorry, the position that was approved in 2022, uh, it was actually approved back in, I believe, 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is related to the new regional organics facility. Uh, so this is to uh, continue to execute those diversion activities uh, at the at the transfer station and also some of the um, other diversion uh, programs that we have incrementally added to the CSWM service. So things like uh, mattress diversion, um, uh, ocean legacy, uh, and new EPR programs that are continuing to come online. This, uh, sorry, that, that position was, was, it was on the books from 2018 when this was originally, uh, when the organics uh, program was originally 
approved by the board. This operator position is uh, intended to uh, really just to maintain the active phase uh, on within cell two uh, as we build it out so that we can have uh, two cells operating simultaneously. But uh, to your point, uh, we are continuing to continually looking to look to efficiencies. But I, I do want to stress that um, prior to 2018, like in the past few years, we were running a very, very lean operation. And uh, that op these operators are, sorry, the last operator was really just to kind of get, get us back on track so that we can start to undertake those um, more um, higher diversion activities, looking to high grade materials so that we can start to remove a lot of uh, the, the, the materials that we can uh, find higher diversion activity, or sorry, higher value for. Uh, I think that, that was, also, that answered their question. Yeah, that, that was helpful. Um, just could you clarify whether or not the operator was um, added in 2018 or, or was it last year? And what has it just been one additional operator in the last um, five years? Is that, is that correct? It was formally added uh, as in last uh, in last year's budget. Uh, the operator was actually onboarded in, I believe, uh, September. Actually, it took us quite a while to find a um, an operator to that met our requirements. So he was onboarded last year, but it was contemplated back in twenty eighteen. Okay, and it's just been one in that whole time period, one additional staff member. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> but thank you. Thanks for the clarification. I appreciate it. Okay, and we're uh, got a question now from Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm glad we're still on the receipt because I my comments will address the potential motion coming up. And I, I think it's fair to say that um, it's it's within the authority of this board to decide what share um, of our revenues come from typic fees versus property taxes. And we've had that discussion every year last term, and then we ended up knocking it down um, by a million during the COVID renewal period. And now we're proposed, staff is proposing to start re-increasing it. But I think it's a philosophical, as Director Mawini and, um, and Director Kerr are hinting at, it's really a philosophical decision around what share goes to the users versus every single resident. And, um, and my question would be, I mean, we're, you're not presenting two options and we're already gonna consider some tipping fee bylaw today uh, or later on unless I'm wrong, but um, my question is, what would be the impact if we wanted to maintain the tax acquisition at 5 million mm -hmm. for, the, for the future? And instead the tipping fee was the one was, that was fully adjusted. And I, I know the tipping fee is about 10 million or so. And the, um, uh, the uh, requisition is 5 million, so half. So when we say we're gonna move from 140 a ton to 145 a ton, maybe the decision that could be before this board if we wanted to maintain the requisition the same is that we would go from maybe 140 to 150, 152. Do we have that figure to understand? Because the, the, the increase on tipping fee would be smaller, obviously, because it's a bigger number that we're dealing with. And I think it'd be good for the board to, before passing bylaws, to, to unless staff wants to leave it to the next meeting where we're starting to stack against our, our uh, our decision requirements for me i'd be quite prepared to bypass the the request uh, and the motion propose and go straight to the discussion as to whether today we want to give direction to maintain the requisition for taxes at the same level and instead adjust the tipping fee um mr chair the uh, the director is correct this is a decision that rests with the board but it is a significant decision with many consequences. And uh, in order to help previous boards with that decision and setting a, a strategy for what should be taxed and what should be uh, tipping fees, a great deal of study work has been done. And it really was a strategy that was adopted uh, uh, over time and with due consideration of many, many matters. 
I think it would be well worth the board receiving this, that background and that information before you consider what your strategy will be. And I also caution you in terms of making changes to tipping fees late in the process because we have to inform our municipal partners and the various different others that utilize the service. They can't react you know, just over a period of months or otherwise, they need lead time to know that uh, what tipping fees will be over time. But certainly you could, you know, make a, a decision to adjust your fees in the future. And uh, I think this report, uh, if, if it is requested of us, will, will help uh, this board to understand those consequences and implications and considerations, as well as uh, the thought that was given to the strategy that we, we currently have. Great. Thank you, CAO. And there are a couple of questions online. Um, Directors uh, McCollum and Thiessen have spoken already, so I'll go first to uh, Director Colburn. Good afternoon and through the chair. Um, thank you, Director Arbor, for your comments. Um, that was kind of, uh, um, those were going to be some comments that I would make uh, as well. Um, as for questions, I'd like to go back to um, when Mr. Shaw said he was talking about a two-year term uh, employee. And I'm wondering about um, kind of recruitment and retention. Uh, so the position was filled, the, the other position, term position was filled, uh, or employee position was filled last year in September. And going forward, you're looking at adding another position. Um, can you speak a little bit about, um, you know, how attractive that is for a two-year term, um, you know, in this um, climate, in this, in, in this climate um, where things are a little uncertain already and, and what that, um, what you are expecting? Um, from trying to recruit and retain someone at, uh, in that position. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Director. Uh, it is, uh, those term positions are certainly harder to fill. Um, it was this, last year when we were looking for uh, the operator position, it was a bit of a different market at that time, uh, combined with the housing challenges. Um, with, with the rising cost of uh, our, our homes, it, it did prove to be a bit of a challenge, um, but we did ended up finding somebody that uh, we were very happy with uh, and was able to uh, secure uh, this individual. For the two-year term, um, yeah, it, it is going to be dependent on the market conditions. Uh, from what we are able to see, it, it hasn't been as, as big of a a challenge for for this year, but uh, th that's to be determined. Unfortunately, we we I don't I don't have a solid answer for that. Thank you for that. And and if I may, um, further to that, is there any um, longer term options? As this is a cell that is not going to um, stop operating. Um, so is that any kind of consideration um, for you um, uh, as the solid waste function? Right now, the proposed term is just for the two years while we are padding out cell two. Uh, the intention is to eventually, once we build out cell two, once we pad it out to the, the prescribed depth that we need uh, so that we can start to put the, uh, the construction and demolition waste within cell two, uh, we will be moving from cell one to cell two to consolidate that operation. So we won't need the second operator, um, but, and that's based on the, the fill plan at, at the rate that we're filling up our landfill. Um, that's kind of the, the projections that we're seeing, um, but the two-year term is, is in alignment with that. Okay, uh, Director Colburn, did you have a further follow-up? That was all for me. Thank you to, to the staff. Great, thanks. Uh, and we'll go next to uh, Director McCollum. Thanks again, Chair. Yeah, I, I did want, did have a note that I wanted to weigh in on the um, discussion around um, the tax requisition piece of um, paying for our capital costs and and just the way that we calculate that. I mean, it, it's the slide 
certainly stood out for me, um, just what the average household is paying into that um, requisition versus, you know, in a in Courtney or Campbell River in an urban area versus the rural areas are, um, you know, the average is, is in some cases a third less um, in some areas than others. And these areas also coincide with um, where it's probably most expensive to deliver waste services just um, based on the geography. Um, and I'm, I'm not an advocate for doing something like a flat tax. I don't, I don't think that that's a, a fair way of assessing this either. So I don't know what the most equitable way is of delivering a service, but certainly doing it on an apportionment of property values is maybe not the best. And perhaps the tipping fee is more equitable when we're looking at that, that you're, you're paying in, in terms of what waste you produce and generally people um, with higher incomes do tend to consume more and therefore um, use up more waste disposal services. So um, I don't think that we can go to um, a tipping fee model and that we can collect enough revenue to pay for all of our capital costs, but maybe we do wanna look at the balance there and um, consider if the tax requisition is the way that we wanna fund all of our capital or if there's another um, ratio that we want to consider. So um, I'm definitely in support of spending some time considering that, although I think uh, I, I certainly take our CAO's um, advice that doing it quickly in advance of the upcoming fiscal is, is too short of notice for all the partners that are involved in the service. But I, I do think that there's value in, in taking some time to consider that given that we're a new board and that we've got a, a you know, a four year uh, term in front of us and how we want to manage the service. So I just wanted to make those comments um, in advance of the motion that's coming up. Thank you. Great, thanks Director McCollum, appreciate that. And uh, last we have online is uh, Director Thiessen. Thanks, yeah, I was hoping that we could hear a bit more about the, or some about the greenhouse gas methane emissions implications from the compaction that is being planned, wondering if that is going to pre-release a bunch of uh, methane that we might be capturing later in the capping stage of the landfill, as well as I imagine that's a machine that's running around uh, all day, every day. Thanks. And we'll pass that to Sarah Willie. Thanks. Thank you for the question through the chair. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions would not increase from the compaction itself. Uh, there are, as you say, associated emissions from the equipment that's operating. However, as I think you'll see in the report uh, that's forthcoming, the emissions from mobile equipment mm -hmm. are dwarfed in comparison to those from the landfill itself. So the, the value of that airspace um, is very important um, for the community to, uh, to use to its, its best uh, ability. Um, and so following best practices that a compaction is, is our, our number one goal. Director Deason, any follow-up on that or is that? Uh... Very satisfactory, thank you. Okay, great. Um, and I think that is all for questions in the room and online. So I think we can uh, now vote on receipt. Anyone opposed to receipt? Great, and that passes unanimously. And we have the uh, the motion by uh, Director Kerr. Uh, Director Kerr, do you want to uh, speak uh, speak to that? Thank you, Chair. And I don't know if you are able to put it up on the screen or not, but I'll read the motion. It's up. Um, it's up. It's up on the screen. But oh, if it, you want to read as well, that's always good. I move that staff prepare a report on why the solid rate waste requisition was created and how the annual amounts were established and a requisition comparison of BC rec regional districts that operate a landfill. Second, Wally. Thank right, you. That's, that's be, thank you very much. That's been moved and seconded. Did you want to speak to that, Director Kerr? Yeah, yeah. just shortly to it. I think we've got a lot of new members on the board. Um, and an interest in providing history and context um, that this would be this would go a long way. Um, there's a lot of concern 
in Campbell River and the uh, northern part of the, uh, the district about the requisition uh, tipping breakdown. So uh, we look forward to the report. Great, thanks very much. Is there anyone else who wants to speak on that? I see uh, Director Arbor, just a second. I, I think that's a very reasonable um, motion. And I think we received that information last term. So it was useful at the time for new directors to understand the history of that requisition. And again, that philosophical uh, approach is is really usually what ends up being the, the, key, the key debate because we do have options. Um, and for me, I'm not sure if this motion will satisfy. I'm still absorbing what uh, Dr. McCollum said um, and our CAO, but at the same time, I think all of our jurisdictions are facing significant potential for tax increases this year on property values. And we all know that for 95% of our other services, we don't have tipping fee option. We don't, we don't make people pay for parks. We don't, you know, we don't have user fees as a significant portion of a service that we provide in our municipalities and regional districts elsewhere. So this is, to me, it's still a palatable. I would have liked staff three months ago to think about presenting different options for today. I don't, I never like to be told, well, it's too late for this year when we're being asked to consider a 10% increase. So I'll still vote in, in favor of Director Kerr's motion, but I, I'll, I may reserve uh, more comments for later. All right, thanks, Director Arbor. And uh, I see in the room, uh, Director Mawinney, and I'm just gonna get your mic live. There we go. Thank you. I just had one quick question about uh, the report that is being requested, and would it potentially also include uh, a comparison of tipping fees as well as the requisition in other regional districts? Uh, Mr. Chair, by all means, yeah, we can include that, and that generally is what we would do. And I also wanted to say there were, were a lot of other questions around this in terms of timing and such that we will address in the report uh, as, as well. That we've, we, we've, we've heard the other questions surrounding this, and we'll pro prepare a report that uh, tries to address all the comments and questions that we heard and recorded. Great. Thanks, CAO. And I see uh, Director Kerr of uh, Comox. Director Marwini stole my thunder. Yeah, I was just hoping also to have that, that comparison, the, the relative, uh, like the ratio between the tipping fees um, and the tax requisition. I think, you know, also looking at other BC regional districts or other even municipalities, jurisdictions, like are there any creative solutions that they're using that we can we can learn from? So I would assume that'd be a part of the, of the report, but I'd be interested to know if there's some unique um, uh, ways that other communities are approaching this. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Director Kerr. Um, I don't see any further uh, questions online, so the, the motion is on the floor. So um, anyone opposed? Seeing none, I'm not sure if there are any online. I don't hear or see any hands. All right, and that passes. And there is a further recommendation. All right, moved by Wells. <laughs> Hoping we'd find a seconder for that. Director Grant, thank you very much. Uh, and is there any discussion on the recommendation? Uh, Director Arbor. Thanks, I see that uh, part of the recommendations, I, I, I'm probably in favor, but it, it's all in the language really that the board, the last part in that the board provides feedback for staff to consider for inclusion into the recommended budget. And I guess my feedback would be, could we have a scenario that uh, there's two options for the recommended budget, one that increases tipping fees only and the other one, which is the, the, what's being proposed today. Um, and, and partly why I, I'm a little bit more uh, strong on this is one of the key questions that this the prior board or this board asked uh, when we did the renewal fund, the, the, the COVID renewal process, and we lowered the tax requisition from $6 million to $5 million. Our key question was, is this sustainable? Are we going to bring it down only to bring it back up later? And at the end, at, at the time, the, the, the sense was that we were bringing it down and it would be sustainable. 
So here we are two years later facing a 10% jump. I think that the philosophical discussion is a valid one. There's a number of directors that have that question around the wait between tipping fee. And I don't know why we would wait an extra year before considering a budget that reflects our possible values. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Director Arbor. And I see uh, Director Wally online. Director Molly, I see you're unmuted, but. Uh... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was waiting for Director Arbor. I guess you already spoke. Yeah, uh, in consideration of the upcoming recommended budget, just uh, my thoughts uh, to staff on this is that when it comes to uh, tax requisition, it provides no incentive for uh, small communities to reduce their uh, waste output. When it comes to tipping fees, it has a major impact. So uh, with that concern in mind, I hope staff will uh, give some additional thought to increasing the uh, requisition or rather decreasing the requisition and increasing the tipping fees a bit. And the other factor that is on my mind is that 2023 looks like there's an indication we may move into a recession mode uh, provincially, maybe uh, even uh, as a national thing. So uh, I think all those factors need to be taken into consideration for the, a public that has difficulty with this requisition. Thank you. Thanks very much, Director Wally. And I see also uh, Director Colburn. Um, I would comment, you know, similarly. Um, I am wondering if there are any options for putting forward um, recommendations for requisition that would lower that percentage this year. Um, for instance, if instead of 11% increase this year and a 4% increase next year, that could even out to a 6%. And a, I'm just wondering if um, you know, you're asking for comments on and, and feedback from, I would be interested in, in knowing that um, to ease the um, sticker shock um, of a requisition this year and, and maybe even that out throughout the, the next two years. Uh, I know that the board was quite adamant about not doing that um, in, in our last iteration. So just some feedback. Um, Mr. Chair, in consideration of the comments being made by the directors, perhaps there would be a motion to amend this to include that staff come back with options with respect to the proposed requisition that consider um, the potential of a decreased impact to the taxpayer of the service area. So that was moved by Wells and actually I'm going to say moved by alternate director Mawinney and seconded by Wells. And uh, so um, that, uh, that motion is on the floor. <laughs> um, any, uh, anyone care to speak further on this? Uh, Director Wells. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. And, and I, I think this is, you know, uh, again, there's so many pressures that, that are coming down and uh, I, I really appreciate um, uh, the concern around this. It's, it's been the same concern that, that I've heard for the last eight years. So uh, since, since I've been somewhat involved um, and, uh, but I also see the challenges um, changing tipping fees, you know, um, uh, with the, again, contractors and, and uh, people doing pickups. So it, 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 it's, you know, I, I certainly want to get the information so we can make the best decisions. I feel somewhat uh, easy about it because this is like, I'm, this is kind of my second meeting with solid waste uh, in many years. So, uh, uh, but just really being uh, cautionary that uh, we might get information that we might not be able to necessarily act on for um, this year. Uh, but really getting that information so that we can set ourselves up uh, over the coming years for sure. So. Okay, thanks uh, alternate Director Wells. Um, I let's see uh, Director Wally online. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just the uh, thought on that, that last comment that uh, a change in the tipping fees at this stage might be difficult. Uh, question to staff, would it be possible to uh, implement uh, 
changes of that nature on a uh, gradual basis rather than have an instant jump, have them scheduled for a couple of months in advance. Um, certainly, Mr. Chair, in, in presenting options, we'll come back with that. But uh, I just I just want to bring the board around to the importance of a five-year financial plan. The last year's five-year financial plan showed that this increase would be taking place as, as the jump back from the renewal direction provided to the board. And uh, yeah, we, we do our best to indicate uh, these things well in advance by, uh, by considering the full five years of, of the financial plan and giving you a bit of a heads up on this too. But having said that, given the direction that you're providing, we will come back with, uh, with a report for possible options and the implications of that. All right, thanks CAO. So if I have this correct, I think first we're voting on the amendment that was proposed. So. Uh, Anyone opposed to that amendment? Okay, looks like the amendment uh, passes unanimously. And um, we'll, now the motion as amended, we'll be voting on that. Anyone opposed to the motion as amended? Seeing no one there, then that is also passed unanimously. And uh, we are now two hours into our meeting. Um, and I'm thinking perhaps we could uh, take like a really quick break, perhaps um, 10 minutes, like a hard 10 minutes. We're back in 10 minutes. So we are, I just say uh, we are on item three of uh, about to start item four of nine. So uh, let's make that 10 minutes and we'll see you back soon. Thank you.
<laughs> Director Arbor. Yeah, sing all that. Never seen Daniel, so, uh, so to everyone online, we're going to resume in about one minute. So just grab your tea and uh, head back to your laptop. Okay, so we're going to call the meeting back to order. Uh, we're now uh, about to start on item four, which is the solid waste GHG emission reduction strategy. And that's for receipts. So that was moved by Grieve and second by Winnie. And I'll pass that over to uh, to the CAO. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And uh, I'd like to introduce Sarah Willey, who, well, who will present this report and answer the questions of the Directors. And just taking a moment to locate the PowerPoint. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have any good jokes lined up. That looks right to me. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you uh, to the chair through the CAO. Uh, so this report uh, that we have before you is uh, outlining the greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategy approach uh, before procurement. So we wanted to outline for you, you know, how we're looking to frame that conversation uh, so that we can get your input in making any changes uh, based on, on your input uh, before we move forward and, and try and make sure we answer all the potential questions that you may have. So what we've got here are uh, emissions reflective of a, a slightly different categorization than what we're proposing. Apologies, that is very small. <laughs> Hopefully uh, for those who have it printed or available digitally in front of you, it's a bit easier to read. So the emissions that we've uh, investigated prior to uh, this proposed uh, approach have been in support of work that the CBRD have done in their emission reporting annually as well as our emission reporting to the federal government for the landfills. So I think uh, for some CBRD directors, they uh, will be familiar with, you know, the relative size of emissions from the landfills compared to example services offered at the regional district level. So what we're showing here are parks, you know, streetlights, fire, water, wastewater, and the, you know, quote unquote, bigger ones are recreation with, you know, ice and pools. The emissions from the Comox Valley landfill and the Campbell River landfill um, are uh, significantly larger at about 26,000 and 39,000. These are the 2019 emissions just based on the last reported amount. What we see in the, the bottom bar there is the Comox Valley Waste Management emissions um, were we not collecting any landfill gas. So those are the modeled emissions of what is estimated to be generated from the landfill. And the, the bar that is blue is the emissions that are fugitive or that escape our capture. The very small red bar is the solid waste transportation. Um, so getting back to an earlier point about uh, emissions from vehicles versus emissions from the landfills themselves. Um, 
are reporting to the Comox Valley Regional District. I uh, previously excluded the landfills um, just per protocols and procedures of, of the uh, programs they were participating in. So uh, moving forward, we're looking at a more comprehensive uh, evaluation. So wanting to catch everyone up on current regulations and, and sort of how we got to where we are today, um, our main regulation that speaks to this is the BC Landfill Gas Management Regulation. And as a result of that, uh, the two landfills, Comox and Campbell River, uh, exceeded uh, the amounts stated within the regulation, which is the 100,000 tons of waste in place. So that's the waste that's been put in over uh, the decades or years um, that results uh, in an excess of 1,000 tons of methane per year. And that amount is calculated based on a prescribed uh, model that the province provides us. Uh, and it looks at things like the quantity of waste, also the composition of the waste, um, our precipitation amounts, um, that sort of thing. So we have, uh, in response to that, uh, landfill gas design plans and enclosure plans. And we began collection at the Comox Valley Waste Management Center in 2016. So our service, you know, in response to uh, federal requirements, we report uh, to Environment Canada as a point source uh, of emissions. And, you know, just wanted to highlight that there's about 1,700 facilities emitting uh, greenhouse gases captured in that reporting. Um, and, you know, we're two of those 1,700. Um, and that, you know, significant gains can be made as those facilities account for 40% of Canada's overall emissions. So this is a bit of a busy graph, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, the most important thing to note, because everyone wants to say, well, how, how did we achieve zero emissions in 2020, is that the bottom of the graph is not zero on the left-hand axis. Uh, it's 15,000, just so that you can see some of the other emission sources there. Um, so the fugitive emissions, so those are those emissions that escape the landfill capture system. This is Comox Valley Waste Management Center landfill only. Uh, those are the largest blue bar. On-site transport, so that's uh, the vehicles that are used to move the waste around. Uh, those, that's a very small black line. Stationary fuel combustion, that's the landfill gas fuel that's used in our boiler at the leachate plant. That's an even smaller amount, arguably not visible on the graph. And biomass is the yellow bar, and that represents the emissions from the flaring of the landfill gas that we do collect. So while still a you know a visible amount of emissions, um, significantly reduced if you compare it to uh, what was estimated to be generated. So our reduced emissions are the difference between the green bar at the top of the chart and essentially the top of the blue bar there. So the yellow is the uh, the resulting emissions just from the flaring of that significant reduction. On the right hand side is the collection efficiency of the landfill gas collection system. And for us, that peaked in uh, 2020 at 63%. Um, that's well within the performance of BC landfills, um, but still within our regulated threshold of 75% collection. So the system is designed to achieve 75% collection. We throw a lot of uh, resources at it to achieve that. Um, however, it's uh, the modeled quantities are generally thought to be overestimated and the uh, sort of rate of return for how much you throw at it and how much you can reduce your emissions, there's there's a reduction there eventually. So we, we are doing a good job, um, but because we have not exceeded that 75% and we have a regulated obligation to achieve 75%, we're not able to capture carbon credits to reflect our efforts in reducing these greenhouse gas emissions. So only carbon credits would be available for these avoided emissions if we were to exceed 75% collection. So just know that comes up sometimes, so we wanted to emphasize that. So some of the ways that we are working towards improving our collection efficiency all the time is by installing you know, additional landfill gas wells, 
by completing closures in a timely manner. So when uh, landfill uh, reaches you know, its final elevation, then we provide uh, that cover system that uh, we you know, most recently did in Campbell River. Um, and then also looking at operational efficiency, making sure that um, you know, we're reducing downtime for uh, you know, power outages, for freezing temperatures, for the accumulation of condensation within the pipes. Um, so that, that all takes uh, personnel to respond to those in a timely manner. If the system shuts down on a Saturday, somebody needs to come out and turn it back on or else uh, it'll be down for two days and, and those emissions won't be captured. So we've spent uh, quite a bit of effort over the past number of years and just wanted to highlight that for some of the directors that haven't been with us as long. So we initiated the closure of the landfill, the Pigeon Lake landfill at the Comox Valley Waste Management Center in 2016. And we did what we call a partial closure. So we went around the outside about two thirds of the landfill and closed it. And we installed 17 vertical wells, three horizontal wells. <clears throat> that was an $8 million expenditure. And that included a header that got us uh, the gas over to the flare station that was installed as part of that project. In 2019, the landfill reached capacity. We did the second phase of closure, so it was 100% closed. We spent another almost $2 million, uh, installed another five wells, and that was our peak uh, performance was that 63% following that closure. So that was when we had the most gas being collected from our fully closed landfill, and we did not have a lot of waste yet in cell one uh, that it's harder to collect from because it is not closed. What you can see from here is, you know, the resulting increase in landfill gas that was collected, um, that initial bump uh, in 2019 as response to that. And then you see a second bump um, just on the right hand side of the graph where we've turned on five additional wells, sorry, um, seven additional wells uh, at the new landfill. So more recent projects um, that we've done, as mentioned, we've got uh, now the engineered landfill. So that's where our focus is gonna be in terms of reducing emissions for, for the coming decades. Uh, now that we have Campbell River closed and installed. So in 2019 to 2022, uh, we're continuing to add horizontal wells. So uh, rather than waiting until we do a closure and installing vertical wells, we add horizontal wells as we go. So every roughly five meters of waste that goes in, we lay those pipes that are perforated within the landfill and we try and turn those on as quickly as we can. There's a required amount of waste you need to put on top so that you're not drawing air into the landfill. Uh, drawing air into the landfill is uh, reduces the quality of the gas, but um, most dangerously causes uh, the ability for fires and heat to be generated within the landfill. And so it's a balance of trying to capture that gas as quickly as possible, um, but not drawing oxygen within to the landfill. We have uh, installed already 13 wells. Um, and you can see the, the cost implications of those wells there. We have uh, four additional wells to install before cell one is complete. And then we're gonna do a partial closure of the outside. So the three final sides on the exterior would be closed, the top won't be, and the inside slope facing cell two would not be closed. There are approximately 61 additional horizontal wells um, that are forecast for cell two just in the next 10 years with an estimated cost of two to two and a half million dollars. Um, and then beyond that, you know, the cost implications will continue as we conduct further partial closures um, and again, try to improve. And then just to reflect on the work that's been done at Campbell River, we spent $11 million for 31 vertical wells, um, the header, the flare, and approximately a nine hectare cover system. So that's kind of brings you up to speed of where we are today, um, but we do have a bit of a, a, a picture of where the future is. Um, and there are new federal methane emission standards for landfills that are in development right now. And they do have implications for us, even as a regulated landfill in British Columbia. So uh, the Government of Canada's Strengthened Climate Plan committed to developing these federal regulations to reduce the waste sector emissions. Um, and what they've identified is that methane from MSW, which stands for municipal solid waste, landfills account for about 24% of the national methane emissions. 
and 3% of overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, our regulations are currently the strictest and not every province has regulations at all. Um, Ontario and Quebec do, um, but it's regulating primarily the largest landfills. The draft regulations are expected to come out in 2014 um, and to be uh, in effect potentially as early as 2025. These regulations are working to reduce methane emissions in a few different ways. They want to increase the number of landfills that take action to reduce methane, so they want to capture those that are doing nothing now. They want to ensure that the regulated landfills uh, maximize methane emissions, and they've identified a few different ways uh, that are differ from our current regulatory scheme. And they want to reduce the generation of landfill methane, um, looking at ways like uh, addressing organics within landfills potentially. We've, we've been participating in the consultation for these regulations um, and working with our, our partners in BC um, and uh, also participating in a technical working group um, to stay on top of this as much as possible and to provide them with operational context in the development of these regulations and certainly highlight for them the cost implications of what they're providing. So some of the, the danger areas that we see are surface emission monitoring programs. Those are currently not part of the British Columbia regulatory environment, but they are in uh, a few American states as well as under the U US EPA. Um, so that entails you know, having a consultant potentially if they don't allow our own staff to do it, walking the landfill, having to mow the grass, you know, a few times a year uh, in non-rainy and non-windy conditions. So try and schedule that. Um, lowering the regulating threshold to include more landfills. I don't think any of our other landfills are currently at risk based on the thresholds they proposed, um, but it could mean that we need to uh, have systems in place capturing gas longer at our closed landfills in Pigeon Lake and Campbell River, for example. They're also considering timelines for addressing repair of leaks that would be identified through some of that surface emission monitoring. And those timelines are very aggressive. Um, and again, managing the welding of the plastic in freezing conditions or wet conditions is very difficult. So trying to get them to understand the implications of 30 day timelines or 90 day timelines um, and not something that uh, aligns with our typical maintenance schedule. And then just general increased operational and capital requirements to address the regulations that are coming forward. So we do want to make you uh, aware of those. But it is important also to consider, um, you know, that this waste is, is already in place um, and that our emissions will never be able to get down to zero. You can see the next slide. There we go. So approximately 40% of methane that uh, is generated in 2030 will be from waste that's already in the ground today. So, you know, just want to make sure that set expectations that getting to zero is, is, is not really achievable, um, but that we can continue to work um, both through the capturing and improving, improving of our landfill gas capturing systems, but also in addressing what's going in the landfill in the future. So this, this chart shows you, you know, the impact of reducing food waste, soiled paper, um, and that's a, a step forward that we've taken um, already this year, and then reducing further uh, biodegradable wastes, such as wood waste, and, and the impact that that can, can provide. So that'll be some of our areas of focus as we go forward uh, through the next 10 years. So highlighting what we've got proposed within the greenhouse gas reduction strategy, uh, a baseline year of 2022, which will be prior to the launch of the organics diversion program and operation of the Campbell River landfill gas system. We're going to be looking at scope one and scope two emissions, and there's certainly aspects of solid waste within our region that fall outside of our operational controls, such as the municipal collection system. Uh, the emissions that result from residents driving to participate in the system, those would be extra or excluded from our emissions as we evaluate the service, but are still part of the decision making that people make when trying to uh, do the right thing. So to address some of those more policy questions and, and things that aren't in a standardized inventory, within Appendix B, we've outlined some of the uh, relevant um, decisions around reuse, um, around um, you know, how curbside program greenhouse gases are different than individuals driving to a specific location to make those decisions, 
um, also the potential benefit and, and status of the use of hybrid or electric vehicles um, uh, as part of the mobile equipment on site. So we're trying to uh, address some of those uh, questions that have come up in the past. And then we're proposing that subsequent to consultation with the public as part of the solid waste management plan on this strategy that we look to develop um, reduction targets for 2025 and 2029 future inventories. So not proposing an annual inventory. There's a lot of work that we know can be done and, and we'd rather focus on that. Um, but we would be bringing back um, at the before the end of this term for the board um, a, a second inventory to reflect on the work that's been done over the term. I'll leave it there and, and take any questions. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. And I see at this point a question from uh, Director Arthur. Thanks. What a what a great report. And uh, there's there's just a few comments I'll have. The first one being uh, to actually thank our chair, uh, Dr. Cole Hamilton, who really um, highlighted the need for CSWM last term to look into this, realizing that uh, as as per your first chart, you know the emissions from this uh, this service for all of us dwarfs most of our services. So if we want want to have an impact, um, this is the place to do it. So. Um, I really want to thank you for your perseverance, uh, Chair Cole Hamilton, and, and making sure that it gets uh, to this table properly. And, and I think staff responded in a splendid way, both in terms of what we've done and what we could do. And I, I'll, I'll talk to the board why I think it's mission critical that we do this. Um, partly, it's, it's as Sarah explained, and she's playing a key role in BC and advocating and uh, being part of that stuff at the provincial and federal level. And... Um, Federally, the Liberals and NDP are quite committed to seeing these kinds of projects, and I think there is an awareness that BC was a lead, and they have they are providing grants to bring everyone else to kind of where we're at. But there's that realization that BC is is not qualifying for a lot of those grants because we've always really met the basic criteria. So Sarah's help, I think, opened up some lines that we might be able to explore. And I think if we do the work of really understanding where the emissions come from and prepare a plan that becomes fundable. Uh, and, and I think we might see support and that's something that as a board would be able to advocate both provincially and federally for dollars to actually, because it will be expensive, quite likely to bring down those emissions as much further. For those who think there might be a change of government and I was with, um, I met the conservative party uh, critic for environment and climate change in December he was giving a presentation on the platform for the Conservative Party. And what his key message was to me is, well, we don't really believe in carbon tax and carbon credits and those things. He said, I, we want to see real reduction in carbon. Like, show me a project that brings real reduction in carbon. And that's what the Conservative Party will want to fund. I'm like, awesome. So I thought right away about the service. So I think under any political scenario, if we do this work, I think we'll be really well posited to showcase how a region really tries to admit to uh, to dent their uh, their corporate emissions. So uh, really great. So I'm very supportive of us proceeding with uh, with this plan. Great. Thanks, Director Arbor. And I see uh, Director Kerr in the room and Director Martin online. So we'll start with Director Kerr. Yes, thank you for the report. Uh, my question goes back to one of the earlier slides about the 75% uh, threshold for carbon credits. I'm just wondering, how can we get them? Uh, what, what's the way to get to that 75%? So that's, a, I know, a big question, but curious, like, if there's a plan to get there. And secondly, um, if we did hit the 75%, uh, what would that mean in terms of, like, actual money uh, carbon credits? Like, what would we see uh, returned, uh, and how does that work? Thanks. Yeah, so there are a few examples of jurisdictions that have uh, spent some engineering money to establish their own uh, models for estimating the emissions from their landfills. Um, those have been recognized by the British Columbia government and they're allowed to use those in their reporting. Um, even with those models, they're, they're still just at 75%. You know, they're not at 90, they're not at 100. Um, and the federal government hasn't indicated yet whether they would accept alternative models. Um, they've proposed within the working group the model that they're looking at, and it, it very much um, leans on the British Columbia with some improvements based on US EPA, um, as well as uh, international improvements with the IPCC. So 
I think our ability to get beyond the 75% um, is difficult, um, but we're, we're gonna work towards that. Um, in terms of the value, if we were to achieve 80 or 78%, um, the revenue would only be generated by that additional, so the 3% or the 5%. Um, and so, you know, the numbers are still relatively large, um, but cost benefit um, would have to be evaluated. Uh, there's uh, the emissions, the carbon credits there's that are associated with avoided emissions fall within that 75% threshold. The other carbon credits that we've been in conversation with um, gas users are the, you know, avoided emissions from the alternative fuel. So there's sort of secondary credits um, that as part of our proposal for the, the use of that gas, uh, we give up those credits um, so that that, that environmental benefit um, goes towards uh, that pro supporting those projects to use that gas for renewable natural gas. So just uh, didn't touch on that in the presentation, but there are those two types um, and the examples of, of financially supporting those RNG projects is that those, those uh, associated environmental attributes go with the gas. Great, thanks very much, Sarah. And I'll go now to uh, Director Morin. Um, well, uh, I mean, I I wanted to comment similarly to Director Arbor, the point that those that are, um, you know, that, that don't even have regulations are now eligible for, <laughs> for grants to get them up to speed. So um, I just wondered if there was anything in the wings for, uh, those of us, particularly in BC, that have um, are working hard on this, and in terms of uh, you know some kind of compensation that that helps us move forward with with uh, with um, these these great changes, um, and you know whether that includes doing more advocacy, as uh, Daniel was sorry, Director Arbor was talking about. Um, yeah, sorry if I missed anything in the report, but I just was curious about uh, what's there for those of you know those of us who are doing the work and and making the improvements that are that are needed. Thanks. Yes, thank you um, for the question. We we have been having those discussions within the national working group. I think the the sort of grant funding is sort of outside of that, but they're uh, cognizant of the fact that you know, the carbon credits that they're looking at now, uh, while this regulation is in development, um, because they have created a federal emissions uh, uh, ability for landfills that that have uh, that have installed systems that aren't regulated to benefit from carbon credits right now. And we've we've addressed that as you know, that's just not a that's not a lever for us to pull. Um, so I think speaking back to the ABICC um, and potential for, for drafting something to go forward to them, um, I think we would look there. Um, I'd also raise that we're working with um, a proponent in Campbell River uh, in preparing an application with the FCM for uh, looking at a, a project for the, the, the gas use in Campbell River. Um, and they've indicated we're looking for a feasibility study money, but they've indicated that there's the potential in the future for uh, money to come through FCM. So hopefully that wouldn't leave BC out in the cold. Uh, thank you for that. And I think that's a, a really good reminder that um, all of our opportunities are coming up in the next few months to, to be sort of on the ground doing the advocacy and whatever we can do um, as a group or um, by municipality or, or whatever to uh, to get those resolutions and, and lobbying ready to go um, with some staff support would be awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Director Morin. And I see uh, Director Tyson. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm curious, uh, there's a couple different ways of calculating the greenhouse gas emissions implications from methane over different timelines. Um, so I've seen figures of, you know, 20% more impactful versus 80% more impactful than carbon dioxide. For instance, I'm curious uh, which of those is used to compare the emissions from landfill gas versus the other parts of the operation. 
Yeah, within the standardized reporting function that Environment Canada provides us, uh, they use 25 as the multiplier for methane to uh, equivalent carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, well, that yeah, that's interesting. I mean, some of the discussion that I've heard around the difference of using those two ratios is is quite interesting. And I, I personally fall into more of the 80% camp uh, just because then, you know, the near term timelines are quite a, quite a bit more critical in some ways than the longer term. So um, it's interesting to see that chart is so amazing of just how much of overall operations the landfill gas is and what what a concentrated area of opportunity for reduction that is. Um, so super excited about this work. Glad to see that it's happening. And um, thanks. Great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tyson. And uh, I was going to ask staff if it's possible that the slides were graded for them to be attached to the minutes uh, as a, just a resource for directors to go back to. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, I'm not seeing any further comments in the room, or I think I saw a hand just go up online. Uh, so, Director Davis? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to ask this question of staff. Um, I think I already know the answer, but um, some of our like small landfills, such as Tassus, um, it's been in the same place for about 50 years, and we do nothing, of course, to capture GHG. And um, I'm wondering if there's any rationale for doing that or are the cost too high for the benefits would be gained because obviously it has to be collected and then compressed and removed because there is no pipeline. So yeah, that's my question, thanks. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, you know, there's an example, uh, Mount Waddington's landfill uh, at Seven Mile is, you know, comparable in terms of precipitation, slightly higher tonnages for sure in terms of what it's receiving. Um, but I think, you know, as we work through the closure process of those landfills on the West Coast, um, we can consider those opportunities. Um, Squamish landfill is another one that comes to mind where they've uh, implemented a sort of simplified collection system. Um, and even just the flaring, it, it can be close proximity. You may not need a lot of piping. Um, uh, the destruction devices, you know, can provide those, those reduced emissions. But, you know, based on my knowledge of the annual tonnages that have gone into Tassus and Zabalis and, and then, you know, the age of the, the Gold River landfill, I don't expect that, that those opportunities would be there for us um, for, a, for a more physically uh, capital intensive system. Um, the other alternative is biocover, and that's another area that the uh, landfill that Mount Washington has has been looking at. Um, so that's looking a bit like, you know, the bio um, media that's used to reduce odors. Um, it can be used to reduce methane emissions as well. The challenge is the province is typically um, not supported biocovers in an area that receives as much precipitation as we do on the west coast um, because of their inability to to reduce that that water going in there but that would be considered sort of the lower cost solution that that would result so those are some of the opportunities that we could evaluate um, as we work through closure plans for for those west coast landfills okay thanks um can, can you expand on what you mean by biocovers yeah, it's, it's, you know, a mix of wood chips and uh, typically a, a biosolid compost type product, um, you know, put in 10 inches, 12 inches thick, um, and then it's the bacteria within that environment um, that, that are absorbing or consuming the methane as it gets released. I see. Thanks again. Okay. Um, no further hands up online and none in the room. So uh, we're still on receipt at this point. So uh, um, all those in, sorry, any opposed to receipt? Excellent. And uh, there is a recommendation. Okay, Arbor and then Wells. And uh, does anyone want to speak to the uh, recommendation? Okay, seeing none, we'll uh, call a vote. Uh, Anyone opposed? Okay, 
Excellent. Um, we'll move on then to uh, item five, appointment of public regional solid waste uh, advisory committee members for solid waste management plan. I'll pass that over to our CAO. Oh, thank you guys, appreciate that. Thank you, Chair and Directors, and Sarah will present this report as well and answer your questions. Thank you through the CAO to the Chair. Um, so happy to report back on uh, the results of our recruitment for the advisory for the Regional Solid Waste uh, Management uh, Committee. And, you know, we, we undertook this process having heard from many of our counterparts um, that, it, you know, it had been difficult to recruit volunteers in this in this time and environment um, and, you know, the efforts they were having to go to. So we were very pleased with the response that we had uh, with 51 applications received for um, a maximum of 15 positions. Uh, we did have great geographic representation um, of both uh, Strathcona Regional District and Comox Valley Regional District. I will say, um, while we did see survey responses from the West Coast communities, uh, we did not unfortunately see any applicants from those communities for the advisory. Uh, so that may be a, a gap that you see. Um, but otherwise, we have great um, representation from islands, rural, urban. Um, and then we also were able to evaluate uh, the experience of the individuals uh, through this process and look at both their you know, uh, lived experience, whether it's personal or professional and pull together a number of different perspectives. Um, so we're really optimistic uh, about the group that we have put forward for recommendation. Um, we'll just highlight as well. Uh, so those are the public members, the 15 members. Um, and we've been in discussion as well with um, municipal staff to um, approach them for up to six members from municipal staff to join us on that uh, committee. So far, uh, the City of Campbell River, City of Courtney, Town of Comox, Village of Cumberland, and Village of Tassis have put their names forward, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and we have uh, one further position that's available um, for someone to join. Uh, Strathcona Regional District, uh, we're grateful to have Wolfang and, and Sheena join us, who are part of the engineering team there. Um, and we also uh, have reached out to the 10 First Nations within our community. Um, we haven't heard back from any yet uh, that they're looking to participate, but we'll continue to reach out and provide that opportunity to them. So in response, we've, we've got a couple of amendments that we propose to the terms of reference um, that address just some costs associated with ferry travel um, and also for uh, the travel of those uh, technical staff members um, coming to us from great distances. So we wanted to be able to uh, compensate them for that. So the two recommendations are about um, appointing the 15 recommended members and then the uh, terms of conditions uh, modifications, terms of reference modifications, I should say. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. I'm seeing uh, Director Arbor, just a second. Thank you for the, uh, 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 and it's great to see a couple of residents from Hornby and Denman. I was pleased about that. Um, but beyond that, for those who are extra keeners amongst us on February 16th, um, are you either recording the meeting or is that something that we can attend at board members just sitting in the audience? My understanding is that the meetings would not be recorded. Um, that's been the approach so far. Um, in terms of uh, elected officials attending in the gallery, um, I'd have to put that to Russell potentially and, and see what his thoughts are on that. Put him on the spot. The, the intention and uh, following what has been done in other communities was not to include um, political members and either on or in observation, but for us to have thorough reports to you as to what the recommendations are. But we certainly, this is a vehicle of yours. So uh, we're open to your, your direction. And I will just, because I know there's more than one committee out there, we have uh, the co-chairs of this board are the co-chairs of the advisory. So there are two elected officials representing uh, the group. I'll just refer my question because I think the CEO advice was in the gray area. So is this a public meeting? Um, no.
uh, and director grieve. I'm going to sing a song that's been sung at this table a few times. Um, you know, we're living in a time right now where it's very difficult to get people to volunteer. That uh, all the service clubs are uh, down to a rump with their former selves. A lot of associations that used to have boards of 20, 24 people are down to half a dozen. So I do applaud the fact that we're at least acknowledging uh, the members of the public taking time out of their day and, and participating because it, it does increase the value and, and the level uh, and the quality of, of the participants that we rely on for a lot of our policy. Um, I know that uh, a lot of organizations now pay their volunteers to volunteer. It's still a bargain. So I, I would encourage that, that that model be used in a lot of our policy committees because it, it would make the people obviously reimburse them uh, for the, the expense of, you know, traveling because uh, gas and being what it is and everything. But also um, just that kind of a nod of acknowledgement, you know, just the fact that we value their time. So I, I do uh, I do encourage that, and I, I thank you very much for in, in, in including that as some kind of remuneration for them. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We, I, uh, the terms of reference as they stand uh, do include an honorarium for public uh, members that are participating, as well as First Nations members should they come, as well as that travel compensation piece that we're just making a modification to. Thank you, and I see now uh, Director Kerr. So, you know, I, I would assume that for this group, an in-person meeting would be best, uh, you know, the richness of the discussion and some of the topics that they'll be going into, but also recognizing that, you know, it, it, it is missing representation from the North and the West. Um, is a hybrid option available as, as this meeting is? Um, and if so, could, could we encourage more attendance from uh, other locations? Yes, we did address that through the recruitment um, where we're asking for limited in-person engagements. So to set the, the tone and to try and build that rapport and comfort level with each other, uh, the first meeting is in person. Um, and then we're conducting a facility tour of a number of different types of solid waste activities within the community that will also be in person on a bus. Uh, nothing says cooperation like road trips. And then uh, for the subsequent meetings, um, you know, unless necessary, we're going to offer that hybrid format um, to be able to have uh, the folks uh, participating from farther afield uh, not have to expend as much of their day to travel to participate. So um, hopefully we can we can set some some good uh, collaborative groundwork in those first couple of meetings and then, you know, as needed, depending on the topics or or you know, the, the tone of the, of the group, um, we can balance that hybrid versus uh, in-person. That, that's encouraging to hear. I guess maybe then, um, let's say someone isn't able to make all the way here for the first visit, but then in subsequent years would have valuable information and, and input from, uh, from, from our more rural districts. Um, I, I wouldn't want to see their not being able to attend the first meeting as, you know, uh, a barrier for them to participate in the future. So I know a lot of work has gone into this list and, and I'm sure these these people, some of which I recognize the name are are great. But um, again, as, as much geographical distribution uh, representation on this as possible, uh, that would be my my preference. Yes, thank you. We do have a representative from Sayward uh, that did put their name forward, um, and as well from some of the Northern Island communities. Um, it, uh, it is just the Tassis, Sabalas, Gold River area, um, where we do have uh, Mark Thatchell, the CEO of Tassis, joining us on the technical side to provide some context as well. So um, certainly if there would be vacancies that would come up, um, we could, you know, uh, direct our recruitment to those areas in the future. Um, but. Thank you very much, and thanks. It sounds like a lot of effort has gone into trying to make this as diverse and representative a group as possible. So thank you for and staff for all of that uh, that work. We're currently on receipt. So anyone opposed to receipt? Okay, and that passes unanimously. 
And then there is the recommendation. Okay, and uh, so was that Wells initially, or is it Wells and Arbor? Okay, and anyone opposed? Great, that passes unanimously. Um, we are now moving to uh, the tipping fee and solid waste disposal regulation bylaw, and if I get a motion for receipt. Okay. Thank you very much, board uh, and chair. And Vivian Shaw will present this report and the two recommendations and answer your questions. Thank you, Russell. Through the chair to uh, the CSW and board, uh, this report here is uh, an, a proposed amendment to the bylaw 720 that was actually. Uh, Adopted by the June, or sorry, by the previous board back in June of 2022. Uh, the bylaw 2720 is uh, the TIP fee and uh, regulation bylaw that outlines the use of the facility and sets the the fees and charges uh, for the Campbell River, or sorry, the Campbell River and the Comox Valley Waste Management Centers. Uh, the changes uh, that were made last year really primarily dealt with the, the TIP fee. Uh, going from 140 to 145 dollars per ton from municipal solid waste, and that is again uh, in accordance with uh, the CPI scheduled increases as approved by the board. Uh, and then some of these other changes were, or sorry, the, these changes again were re really intended to uh, dr drive the positive um, uh, be waste diversion behaviors that we're going to be able to see. Uh, as well as applying those financial penalties and higher enforcement levels for contaminated loads at those uh, two sites. <clears throat> uh, at the time, due to the extended, extensive redrafting of uh, the bylaw and the recognizing the financial implications for municipal partners, uh, businesses, and the general public, and also with consideration for alignment with um, the budget uh, approval process for our municipal partners, uh, the intention was to really provide to provide that six month uh, advance notice to the general public, businesses, and municipal partners to uh, be able to consider it within uh, their budgeting processes uh, in advance of the January first effective date. Uh, usually, uh, there would have been an additional clause added as a recommendation uh, in as part of that staff report that went forward in June uh, to amend the uh, ticketable offenses in alignment with uh, bylaw 720. But uh, unfortunately, there was no existing ticketing bylaw associated with it. Um, so as that portion of the, of the update wasn't uh, time sensitive, the decision at the time was to was made to leave that part of it uh, for a later date, um, being, so that we don't, didn't complicate the process. So we are bringing forward that uh, that portion of it to you today. Um, so as part of the the review of Bylaw Seven Twenty, uh, we just clear uh, amended some of the language to improve clarity to so that we have uh, greater enforceability of the actual bylaw so uh, the clean and the um the red line version is uh, provided in appendix a and b um and then the table of the actual ticketable offenses uh, can be found in appendix c and that outlines all of the so it's in alignment with uh, what we have stated under the conditions of use um and one more thing that we wanted as wanted to um to bring to your attention is uh, in preparation for that uh, uh, to be update and through the consultation with um, some local businesses, uh, specifically for the local wood wasting wood processing business, um, we had originally uh, proposed that we would drop the clean wood waste fee from one hundred and twenty dollars per ton to one hundred and ten dollars per ton in effort to increase that uh, to encourage diversion on site. Um, but what we re what we realized is that that there was an unintended consequence, um, which would likely uh, cause operational impact to our service, and also put us in a position where we'd be uh, competing directly with our um, uh, local businesses here. Uh, and just to give you a bit of context, um, if we're proposing that we're bringing, just to put it back up to the $120 per ton so that we're not at least in direct competition with um, 
uh, local businesses. And just for um, just for reference, uh, we received roughly about 350 tons last year, and the differential, uh, that $20 differential that you see, it amounts to roughly about $7,000 per year. And based on the conversations that we've had uh, internally here for the impact that it could potentially have um, from and the, the, sorry, the effort that's going to be required to um, pull out the, the, the the contamination that we are seeing um, will likely negate the, that seven grand that we are getting uh, if we were to maintain that $120 per ton in order to meet the uh, contamination requirements at the local processing facilities. So we're proposing that uh, we bring it back up from the $110 back up to the $120 per ton specifically just for the wood, wood waste uh, line item. So there are two recommendations uh, before you, uh, the first one being the uh, proposed amendment uh, to the update uh, for the language uh, pertaining to section two uh, under condition of use for again greater enforceability and also alignment with the ticketing and adjudication bylaw uh, and the, uh, the change in the wood waste to be that I just talked about. And then the second recommendation is uh, consideration for um, giving readings to the updates to the ticketing and adjudication bylaw uh, later on in this agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Shaw. Um, looking to see if there are any questions or comments at this point. Okay, seeing none, so we'll vote on receipt. Anyone opposed? And that passes unanimously. And there are two recommendations. Okay, Arbor and Grant on one, recommendation one. Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. And recommendation two. Okay, like sound like uh, Grant and Wells. Anyone opposed to recommendation two? That also passes unanimously. And so now for receipt, we're uh, look, moving on to the uh, board code of conduct policy review and update. And I'll hand that to the CAO. Oh, sorry, move receipt. And thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And I introduce Jake Martins, General Manager of Corporate Services, which will outline this proposed policy and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair, I'll uh, try and keep my comments here as succinct as possible. I've just got a brief presentation. So um, uh, late last year, the CBRD board uh, gave tentative approval to an amendment to their existing code of conduct policy. Uh, and as part of our practice to bring forward any matter that would have corporate wide implication and uh, therefore implication to the CSWM board, we bring that forward uh, for comment and feedback prior to considering formal adoption. And so. This uh, policy amendment is, is being brought forward for your feedback and consideration. Um, the policy was first adopted in 2020, uh, and the amendment that the CVRD board is considering is to add in provisions regarding a complaints and enforcement process. Uh, likely the SRD under the new provincial legislation is, is also considered or is considering a code of conduct. And so in relation to your uh, participation here at this board, this policy would be the, the applicable one. Uh, Sorry, Lisa, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, so before just uh, getting into some of the specifics of the policy, it's worth just providing a bit broader context around uh, elected officials' conduct. And there's uh, generally sort of two areas that these can be grouped into as far as the framework that guides the elected officials' conduct. There's those ethical standards and that's sort of the, the legislated or common law uh, rules that elected officials must follow. Um, you'll of course, be familiar with some of those uh, acts there, such as the Community Charter, the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act, and the Criminal Code. And so these would be uh, certainly the most severe and uh, have most consequential impact should should a breach uh, of those acts uh, be uh, determined. And uh, those are most commonly referred to or most frequently re referenced in regards to conflicts of interest that elected officials may find themselves in. Uh, the other grouping there is uh, responsible conduct. And this uh, refers broadly to kind of how you conduct yourself with your elected colleagues, with staff, and with the public. And so the board code of conduct is, is certainly uh, central to that, as well as our procedure bylaw, which guides how meetings are conducted. 
Um, thanks. Uh, so the policy itself uh, outlines seven general principles, which serve certainly as, as sort of foundational to the policy uh, and provide that that measure, that bar that, that uh, conduct would be um, measured against. Uh, they are in, uh, integrity, accountability, leadership, responsibility, respect, openness, and collaboration. The policy has a you know, very brief uh, uh, explanation or description around some of those, uh, but generally they are broad in nature. And uh, these also reflect, although they're not mirrored precisely, but they reflect the broad principles which are included now in provincial legislation, which you as an elected official would have sworn to with your oath of office, and uh, that are also have been suggested and highly recommended by the UBCM's working group on responsible conduct. The policy also includes a number of general provision, provisions. Some of these uh, very much mirror some of the language uh, and requirements uh, from other acts or otherwise, but they, they cover uh, conduct generally, conflicts, uh, meetings, the policy role of the board, uh, use of public resources and communications and others. So with respect to the actual amendment that's that's being brought forward, um, the complaints and enforcement process, uh, we've looked at local governments across the board from the very, very large to the very small uh, in both the context of regional districts and municipalities. And we think we've created what we would feel is a sort of made in the Comox Strathcona approach uh, that we hope uh, hopefully um, uh, will be successful with. Uh, it includes three uh, key components, that being an informal complaint uh, aspect, a formal complaint, uh, process and then finally uh, the remedies or sanctions that could be rendered by the board. Um, in our case, uh, most policies contain an informal complaint uh, procedure or process and that's highly suggested. Uh, the working group, as I mentioned earlier, referenced that uh, most conflicts uh, are best dealt with through informal means and not the formal process. It also happens to be the most cost effective approach as well. So by all means, we should be encouraging and trying to focus our efforts there. So in our case, we we have that listed. It's optional uh, under that uh, under that first component, but certainly is recommended. And then with the initiation of the formal complaint procedure, there's also again an informal uh, approach in which the chair and uh, CAO can seek that resolution without uh, engaging a third party or some complex and costly uh, investigation. Um, so under that formal complaint procedure, as it notes there, uh, when a complaint is received, the chair and CAO will, will work to seek resolution to it. Should that not be achieved, that is when a, a third party, a, th a third party neutral uh, investigator with the skills and expertise necessary would conduct a preliminary assessment. Uh, that's not a full blown report, but it's basically determined whether there should be an investigation or whether it should be disposed of in, in some regard. And uh, if an investigation is determined, determined to be necessary, that is when a formal investigation is conducted and then that is provided to the board for receiving consideration. That moves us into the remedy and sections uh, sort of uh, um, uh, process there. And the board ultimately will make a determination if any sanctions should be rendered. Um, uh, and certainly this is, is somewhat new ground in the local government field. And so that is a bit of an evolving nature. We've provided a list in the policy of potential sanctions, but it's not exhaustive and it's not meant to suggest that that is your only option as a board to, to select from those. Um, and uh, and then of course, yeah, if, if the board renders a decision, uh, uh, it would impose those sanctions, and that would be done in a public meeting in which it's transparent to the public about what what has what has been uh, done. Next slide, please. Uh, and yeah, there's uh, lots of education assistance available to the board in this. Should you have an interest or desire to learn more, uh, the Local Government Leadership Academy uh, has sessions, uh, uh, certainly as part of their training that they offer up to elected officials as well as the UBCM. Um, I've already mentioned the Working Group on Responsible Conduct. They do have a, a new e-on-demand uh, learning course, which I highly recommend. It takes about a half hour to 45 minutes and certainly plays through some scenarios of, uh, of uh, and helps kind of elicit consideration around uh, what could be a, uh, a breach of conduct or, or a perceived one. So we'll certainly recommend that to the board and be happy to forward out an email should that not be of uh, awareness to you. And then finally, staff support on this. So if there are any issues or questions that you may have as a director about uh, conduct, uh, certainly we encourage you to reach out to us and, and then we can explore those. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm pleased to answer any questions. And, and I may, it's probably also worth stating that at this point with regards to this policy, uh, we are seeking feedback from, from this board. And so if there is 
particular concern or objection or uh, feedback that you wish to provide back, we'd ask that that be done by resolution. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, your, your feedback comments are, are gladly accepted. But if but if there is certainly objection or concern, we'd, we'd seek resolution. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Jake. Um, not seeing any lights on in the room or <clears throat> Or anyone online, and this is just a uh, vote on receipt. So I think we'll uh, call the question. Anyone opposed to receipt? Okay, great. That passed unanimously. Um, and next item for receipt uh, is the uh, management report. So a motion for receipt. Okay. Ar Arbor and Mowini. And uh, question right off the bat uh, from. Director Arbor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, under item number two, um, I was glad to see the action that uh, an MOU at Comox First Nation was brought forward. Again, our, our main site for the entire service is in um, Comox traditional lands. And, um, and it seems it was well received. There's been an election since. So is the process for staff to just go through the proposed monthly meetings because they have a, a new council or the CSWM have an alternative method because it's not really the CVRD that's approaching them. Um, for the uh, for um, the other directors' consideration, in the past, the um, Comox Valley Regional District has had a relationship with Comox First Nation where we meet on a monthly basis, and at that time, we present to them any of our projects that have relevance to them to seek their feedback. We have used that venue to bring forward issues with respect to this service, and would continue to do so. And uh, when we attend those meetings, um, we have the support of the the chair or co-chair that would attend uh, on behalf of uh, the political representation to to that meeting so that being uh, uh, director baker and director cole hamilton would participate so with a wholly new uh, council of uh, comox first nation we wait their um, consideration of uh, how we move forward we hope that those monthly meetings will continue and in the first opportunity we will begin discussing the memorandum of understanding Standing. And as something is drafted or articles or considerations are, are put forward, we will bring those to inform you, the board, as to, to what that is. Thanks very much. And just a, a minor one for item four and five um, in regards to Cumberland and the statutory right of way in a trail. I think there's support for that, obviously, at the board, but um, hopefully it says staff working the village staff to undertake this work. So hopefully staff working with village staff as opposed to working the village staff. Thank you. We really wanted to represent your interests when we work with them, but yes, it is with. And uh, Director Green. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just number seven, um, of course, we've been talking about a uh, um, recycle BC depot, uh, the south in the south end of Area D, north end of Area C, um, for quite some time. And I know I know it was touched upon in in er, in an earlier um, agenda item. But I'm just wondering. This is not approved for 2022, but staff will continue to advocate. Uh, for Recycle BC's 2023 work plan. So uh, is that live then? Or are we actually going to, uh, what's the process there? Because I think we should keep the heat on. So Vivian, if you don't mind answering that question, thank you very much. Another question. We are in constant communication with Recycle BC. Uh, most recently, uh, they have just uh, gone through their consultation for their uh, five-year plan amendment, which is prescribed by the the provincial or sorry, the, the ministry. Um, one of the things that is uh, front and center for us is the improved accessibility. Uh, for all residents, uh, right now there is uh, the provision for as long as uh you're within 30 minutes or sorry as you have 30 kilometers or 45 minute drive time you are considered uh within a reasonable access and we're continuing to advocate uh to illustrate that the the, the, the need within our community to be able to improve on those times especially for some of our uh, rural communities uh, and the, to the north as well, to be able to ensure that everybody has equitable and free access um, to Recycle BC. Um, so 
It is uh, something that we're continuing to work on. So we've submitted our uh, response to that uh, at the end of last year, um, and we are going to continue to to work with them to get to hopefully be uh, included as uh, part of their 2023 work plan. But yeah, uh, in within our our own internal 2023 work plan, we are looking to. Uh, further uh, the the project up at Oyster River, which will help um, provide that ac improve access for Area C residents of the CVRD and Area A residents of the SRD. D of uh, the SRD, sorry, apologies. Just a comment. Um, yeah, of course, uh, Puntledge Road and Ryan Road are probably seven minutes apart. All right, and uh, I'm seeing no further uh, questions on the uh, the management report. So uh, we'll, we have a motion for a seat on the table. Uh, anyone opposed? And that passed unanimously. We're now on to bylaws and resolutions. So we're in the home stretch. Uh, so in, so the first and second reading for the all right, that's been first and seconded. Um, anyone opposed to first and second readings? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the next. You have 720 here. Three. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, I, said, I thought I said anyone opposed. Let's do it again. Anyone opposed to first and second reading? Excellent. And we have Grieve uh, moving third and uh, Arbor seconding and anyone opposed to third reading? Okay, great. And uh, so moving on to the second item. Okay, and that's the recommendation for bylaw number 743, uh, the district municipal ticket information bylaw for first and second readings. Anyone opposed? And that passes. There's chili in there, folks. All right. Anyone opposed to uh, to third reading? Seeing none. Okay. And last of the recommendations. Wells. Arbor. And this is a recommendation for bylaw number 744, um, the Comox Valley Regional District bylaw. Uh, adjudication ticketing bylaw number 679. And this is for first and second reading. Anyone opposed? Seeing none. And for third reading, Grant and Arbor. Anyone opposed to third? And that passes unanimously. And move termination by Arbor. Anyone care to second? Mawini. And anyone opposed? Unlikely. All right. Thanks for your time, everyone. Appreciate it.